Uh, baiklah, Assalamualaikum. Good morning everybody. Um, <laughs> good morning, my name is Anur Tahira Abdul Hadi. So I'm one of the senior librarians here at uh, Central Library, University of Malaya. Um, so for today, since the topic of today's session is optimizing uh, UM library scholarly resources, I'm going to cover with you four specific aspects of uh, you accessing resources, different tools that you need to know about, uh, and also uh, certain things that you might need to refer to, especially in terms of your publications, such as indexes. Those are the things that we're going to cover today. Um, looking at your feedback from your registration. So most of you are just uh, wanting to know uh, maybe what's what's the current uh, tools or functions that are available uh, within our subscribe uh, da da databases or platforms. So I'm going to go through with you uh, those aspects as well. And if you do have any questions, uh, please uh, go ahead. Uh, either uh, put your question uh, in the chat, okay? Then we can actually cover all the question right before we finish the session, all right? If uh, it's not, uh, it has not been covered uh, within our content uh, throughout the day. <clears throat> okay. Um, so let me just go ahead. So for the start of the session, I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview about uh, what can you can find within uh, the library network or the library co uh, the library uh, collection. Uh, because I'm not sure um, if you have gone through the library briefing before. So I'm not going to go too long for this one. I just want to cover uh, things that are going to be imperative for you to know when you are accessing our services or our collection. Okay, so these are basically the mission of the libraries. This is uh, the services that we cover. So we cover not only physical spaces, we also cover um, uh, information services, okay, uh, knowledge-based services. So those are within uh, the, the capacity of the library. And this is our library network. So uh, in total, we have actually uh, 12 libraries. So we have the central library where most of our centralized services uh, are held. And then we have our branch libraries, uh, three of our bigger uh, branch libraries, which is the Zabba Memorial Library, uh, the Medical Library, as well as the Law Library. So they have specific content and uh, the two branch libraries, which is the Medical and Law Library, is also, uh, uh, also included a professional um, uh, membership, meaning people who are not from UM or people who are in the professional field, they can also be members of the medical and the law library. Okay, so we have a lot of professional memberships there as well, as well as the faculty library. So not all faculties have faculty libraries, <coughs> but the, look, uh, the content of these faculty libraries is usually more specific to that particular uh, faculty's uh, teaching and learning content. All right, but in terms of usage of the spaces and services, no matter where you're located at, you actually have access to all of the libraries. So if, for example, the book or the resources that you want to use uh, belongs to a library that doesn't belong to your faculty, you can still go and borrow, access the library and go and borrow uh, the resources with no limitations. Yeah. OK, so the types of resources we have in the library, so we cover not only physical library, but a lot of um, multimedia and electronic resources. And actually, the biggest collection that we have is actually electronic, uh, digital or electronically accessed uh, resources like e-journals, e-books, etc. as such. OK, so current collection. And um, so different uh, spaces and different types of collection available at the central library and our um, uh, branch libraries. All right, uh, now uh, here I just would like to highlight very quickly um, your borrowing privileges if you're not familiar. OK, so for postgraduate students, you can borrow up to 30 items from the open shelves. So what do we mean by op open shelves? Open shelves are any shelves that uh, you can access straight away. OK, and it has not it does not have any labeling like academic reserve. Usually academic reserve collection uh, are resources that are available behind the specific counter of that particular library. So those usually are academic reserve, but anything else that you see on uh, shelves that you can access directly as soon as you enter the library, those are open shelves. Yeah, so for those items, for postgraduate, you can uh, access those items, 30 items at one time. And 
a single borrowing without renewal is 30 days. Okay, so I'll talk a bit more about renewals because I do understand, especially for academics as well, uh, you borrowing an item for 30 days might not be sufficient, especially if you're using the resources uh, to come up with new programs or uh, new content, new teaching content. So you might need uh, to borrow uh, to, or to access the item a lot longer. So I'll talk to you a bit more about uh, renewal or extending your loans later on. And then we have academic staff full time. So 60 item at one time for 60 days. Um, if we have contract staff, uh, academic staff here in the session. So your um, your uh, borrowing privileges would be 30 item for 60 days. Uh, if we do have PNP staff, administrative professional staff, non-academics, uh, then your borrowing is 35 items for 60 days as well. Yeah. So academic reserve are resources that have been specifically listed belonging or supporting a particular uh, subject uh, or course at your faculty. So usually academic reserve are what you have listed in your main reference for the subject that you are teaching. This is for academics, yeah? Or if uh, postgraduate students within the session who are taking uh, courses uh, for your master's uh, degree, okay? So those would be the items that you can see on the main reference section of the uh, course document, all right? A free range reading is just, uh, for example, uh, non-subject based or non-course based content, yeah? And for all items, for any late returns will be, the overdue fines will be 50 items per day. But the borrowing privileges between the academic reserve and the open shelf determines when the overdue starts. So you have to be very clear if the item that you're borrowing is from the open shelf or the academic reserve, because that means that if you're borrowing from the academic reserve, your overdue starts on the eighth day, not on the 31st day or the 60th, 61st day. Okay. All right, so borrowing procedures, we don't do any counter borrowing anymore. It's all self shared machine. So um, you just need to bring your staff ID, okay, or student ID, student metric card, and you can do the borrowing uh, at any of our libraries. Okay, so uh, when we want to talk about pendeta, so I'm going to um, uh, actually cover access a little bit on. So I'm just going to browse through, uh, I'm just going to go through the different platforms that we are going to cover today. Okay, so the first platform is going to be the Pendita Discovery. And then we are going to look at the A to Z online database listing. Okay, and we are going to select a couple of databases that uh, have features that I would like to introduce to you to help you to uh, maybe search for an article faster or maybe search for a subscribe journal faster. I'll show you which database can help you to uh, make the process easier. And then different types of uh, research skill assistance that we offer. Okay, so we at the, un at the library, we offer a uh, compulsory course, elective course for undergraduates. Uh, for postgraduates, we offer weekly, uh, free weekly workshops. Okay, so postgraduates, RA, RO. So if you have research assistants, research officers at your faculty who would like to know how to use EndNote, who would like to know how to nav uh, do searches, okay, navigate databases, they can also join us for the weekly courses. So we do it every uh, week, okay. Um, throughout the year, all right? So it's usually on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of the week uh, at from 12 to 1 p.m., okay? So I'll show you where they can do the registration as well. And uh, of course, I will show you, especially for the academics, uh, who do you need to contact if you, uh, even if you are not the library uh, committee representative of your faculty, if you need assistance in acquiring resources for your course, or for your students, or uh, for your postgraduate students, or for your faculty, who do you need to contact? So I'm going to show you where you can find the list for the liaison librarian for your faculty as well. Okay. All right. So uh, these are a few of the UM library social media. We post all our updates here. You can follow them. Okay. You're recommended to follow them. So opening hours, uh, I'll show you where you can find it on the website. Um, rules and regulation, I'm sure it's all in the slide, so I'm not going to cover on that further. So for today, uh, these are the session content that we're, to, we're going to cover until approximately about 12 noon. Okay, so first we are going to look at access. So what do you have uh, to access, okay, in terms of whatever that is provided by the library, as well as I'm going to cover the different repositories, institutional content for UM, and I'm also going to show you two national 
databases. Okay, so national databases that I'm going to mention is the national uh, local journal database. Okay, which is my journal where not only uh, not only do you have access to UM journals there, if you want to access uh, journals from other faculties, from other public universities in Malaysia, I'll show you where it is, as well as the uh, national uh, thesis database. Yeah. Okay, and then we have uh, the navigation part. So I'm going to show you uh, specifically how to use or what are the interesting features of the EBSCO dis uh, discovery service. So if you're familiar with um, EBSCO databases, okay, especially for social sciences, uh, a lot of you are using EBSCO databases. So um, there are certain features within the EBSCO discovery service that are useful for everybody. Okay, so I'll show you how to use that particular function. So we'll look at what can the integrated search platform give us as well as how do you check for our subscribe journal titles in real time. So if you want to check, okay, does the library subscribe to this journal from when to when, which issue to which issue or to which volume to which volume. Okay, I'll show you where you can get the information in real time. <coughs> and also, um, not only to the resources that you have access to, but what if you need content that we do not have access to maybe from a database that we don't subscribe or maybe we have limited subscription to the content from that database or that publisher so i'll cover with you article requests and document delivery services as well and then we are going to talk a bit about indexes okay so uh, for postgraduate students and even for academics uh you need to uh, for example find journals within the uh, UM listed uh, web of site indexes or journal within the Scopus listing. So I'll show you how to do the verification. Okay, how do you check if uh, the journal that you want to submit to is uh, belonging to the indexes that you're supposed to uh, take from? Okay, as well as where to go to find uh, not only the journal listing, checking on the quartile and the impact factor, and how do you download the Scopus listing for you to choose your journal titles yeah, to submit to. Lastly, we're going to talk a bit about uh, the tools and note. Okay, so I'm not going to cover a lot uh, here. I'm going to just cover with you the, uh, the installation part. Where do you go to get the software? Because we do not have time to cover the usage for EndNote, but we do offer weekly uh, workshops on EndNote and you are all welcome to join and we are going to talk a bit about turning in because for undergrad uh, for academics uh, you need to know uh, how do you uh, create your turning in accounts if you do not have your turning in accounts for you to allow your student to submit to already okay all right so let's go ahead right. so first we want to talk about the platform of access or the where you can get different types of resources uh, from the UM collection or what we have subscribed to. So when we talk about institutional collection, institutional collection means whatever that the university have purchased. Okay, uh, so it can be books, physical books, it can be multimedia resources, uh, also institutional publications such as thesis. Um, for degree level, it will be uh, academic exercise. For master's, it will be master's uh, thesis and for PhD, doctoral dissertation. So all of those are accessible from the Pandita Discovery. So the Pandita Discovery um, contains anything that we have actually acquired or whatever that has been published within the publication of our institution. And then for our subscription, all of our subscribed and recommended open access databases will be available from our A to Z online database uh, list. Okay, so if you are wondering whether a particular database is subscribed by UM, if we subscribe to it, it will be in this list. If it's not in this list, then we do not subscribe to it. Okay, so um, uh, there's no separate list that you can refer to. Uh, you don't need to <laughs> contact us to see, uh, do we have this database? Uh, actually, because as soon as we have access subscription to a database, we put it on here. So if you check here, the name of the database doesn't appear. Okay, then we do not subscribe to that particular database or we do not have access to the particular database. Yeah, and then we have our institutional repository as well. Uh, available at the digital at UM. Okay, so this contains uh, institutional um, publications. So it means that it con uh, we have a repository for UM journals. Okay, uh, journals published by faculties at UM. Uh, all of our theses and dissertations that have been digitized. Okay, so not all theses and dissertations have been digitized. Um, 
for postgraduate students, okay, once you are ready to graduate, you'll receive a document uh, stating whether you allow the digitization of your thesis, okay? All right, or if you allow the digitization, but after a certain amount of time, all right? So, um, uh, for the ones that we have digitized, and we have a big number of theses that we have digitized, it's all open access, is within one of our repositories as well. So, uh, let me do a bit of a live search together with you so that you can see exactly um, what it looks like. Okay, so first and foremost, if you are trying to access uh, our institutional collection, it will be available from the Pandita Discovery. Everything is accessible from the library website. You don't have to memorize a lot of URL, just the umlib.um.edu.my. Okay, so what you can find here that uh, might be useful for you is when you do searches, we always recommend users, uh, and this is something that you can implement when you do searches uh, on the online database as well, just good practice. Whenever you have keywords to do searches, you always start with title, okay, that will give you the most accurate results. When, uh, if you don't have enough results, you go with subjects, okay, and when you want a wider set of results, more generalized set of results, then you try all fields, which means that the keyword if the keyword appears in the title, in the subject, in the abstract, anywhere within the record that the keyword that you're looking for appears or included by the library or by the author, then you will be able to find uh, the resource. So a lot of uh, uh, information researchers or researchers, they straight away go to all fields, but what they have to do later on is narrow down or filter by themselves the content. Okay, oh, this is actually not my field of study. Oh, this is not my field of study. Oh, this is not accurate. Okay, or oh, it used the keyword, but it is not actually relevant to my search. So, what we want to do, the steps, okay, the best way, what is the priority of search uh, option or search field that you need to use, usually is title and then subject and then all fields. And this is applicable when you do searches on online databases as well. Because even though Pendata collection, uh, pen, when you do searches on Pendata discovery, it might only give you the result in hundreds, but when you do that in online databases, the result that you're going to get is in the millions. So you need to know what is the priority in terms of the searching field that you need to use. Okay, what kind of resources you can find in Pendata as well. Okay, so everything within our collection, it will be uh, under everything. If you're looking specifically for books that you have listed in uh, the main references or you're taking a subject and you are looking specifically for the main references for the subject, you just straight away select academic core collection. If you're looking for local content, okay, so one um, interesting collection that we have within the UM library collection is what we call the IMLA Index or IMLA Collection. Okay, so what is IMLA Collection? So we have found that uh, a lot of local publication, meaning local conference papers, local journal article, uh, journal articles, uh, maybe uh, 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 some uh, local law publications are very difficult to be acquired from uh, major or commercial on another basis. Yeah. Okay. So when researchers, especially when they are doing very localized research, they are doing for Lembah Klang, they are doing for Kedah, okay, especially for our undergraduates as well. Uh, uh, they're they're doing, for example, for localized Malaysian um, uh, uh, um, areas, okay, when they do their research, it's quite impossible for them to get a lot of resources from major or commercial databases like Science Direct or EBSCO because those databases, um, the majority of the publishers or the authors are, of course, from out of Malaysia. Okay, but what that does, but what that means is uh, a lot of things that people have already done, maybe a survey for that topic or maybe a questionnaire, maybe data collection that has been done on the topic, they didn't know it already exists, so they have to go and do it again. Okay, because they do not have access to that journal article, uh, that local journal article or that local uh, conference paper. So what we have decided is we have decided to create this IMLATION index where we collect uh, three types um, of resources, which is conference papers, journal articles, and um, uh, book chapters, okay? Um, for any resources that fulfill one of these three criteria, either it's, uh, it's written by a Malaysian author, 
So it can be a conference paper that they presented in Poland. Okay, but if it's a Malaysian author, we'll try to keep a copy of that conference paper. If it's published in, uh, if it's published in Malaysia, meaning publication, uh, locally published uh, books, book chapters, uh, local conferences, local journals, we'll try to keep a copy of those content, as well as content about Malaysia. So if, if it's about our country, our culture, our economy, anything if it's about Malaysia, if, even if the author is not a Malaysian, even if the place of publication is not a Malaysia, if it's about Malaysia, we'll try to keep a copy of that content as well. Okay, so if you are looking for localized references, okay, you want to see, okay, I'm doing this research, I want to know if other people in Malaysia have done this research or done this topic to a particular extent that maybe I can expound upon. Then you can look into the iMalaysian index and later on when I'll show you the national databases, you can look into those resources as well. Okay, our next is periodical index. So periodical index is either book series or journals. Now we don't have a lot of journals in print anymore. The majority of our journal subscription is already in electronic format. But especially for those who are doing historical research, okay, they might be looking for journal publication from way back, okay. So we're about 115 years old, you am. So uh, we have quite a big and distinguished journal collection comparatively, yeah. So they might be interested in those um, historical uh, uh, publication or uh, older journal issues or volumes, yeah. But everything else, if you're looking for current resources, all of it is going to be available in um, electronic format. Okay, all right. So here also, I would like to uh, show you a bit about your borrowing management. So we have talked just now about your borrowing privileges, right? So for academics, you have 60 items, you can borrow for 60 days, uh, not including renewals. And for postgraduate student, 30 items, 30 days and such. So how do you manage your borrowing? So you borrow a lot of a big number of resources. OK, how do you check when you're supposed to return, when you're supposed to renew? Uh, what you need to do is just head over to your uh, Pandita and then you go in into your My Account. They'll ask you to log in. So your login will be your um, IC number and your password. It should be the same login as your email. If you have any issues with accessing your My Account, please contact us via chat. Uh, we have our chat uh, services. So during the work, uh, even though you are introduced to the chat by um, our very nice chatbot Sri, but actually during working hours, there is a librarian that is available to you. So if you need, if Sri is not helpful to you or you, you don't know which option to choose within Sri, then just uh, just click in into Sari and you will see the option for talk to a librarian and the librarian on duty will be able to actually chat with you live straight away. Yeah, so it's not just the chat board available for you. Actually, during working hours, uh, the librarians, there are actually librarians who are on duty to chat live with you as well. OK, all right. So just log in into your. Account. <coughs> This is what you're going to look like. Uh, you're going to uh, your account is going to look like. So you have your personal information. Please update your personal information, especially if later on you are going to use certain um, acquisition uh, services from the library. Like for example, you want library to help you find certain articles, book chapters, conference papers. Okay, you need to update your your information here, and then your checkouts will be listed here. So if you have 20 items, 30 items for out, it will be all listed here. This is where you're going to do your renewal as well. So renewal needs to be done before the date of the due. So for example, if the item is due today, 20th January, the system will only allow you to renew the day before the due date. Okay, on the due date itself, the system will not allow you to renew before uh, uh, the item anymore because that is the day that you're supposed to return the item. Okay. A bit about renewals, first and foremost, okay, uh, if you're borrowing from the academic collection, you cannot renew the item, you have to return the item, and if you want to reborrow, you have to reborrow at the counter. But any item from the open shelf, you can renew, and how many times can you renew per borrowing? You can actually renew two times per borrowing, meaning you borrow first time 60 days or 30 days, on the day, on the 29th or the 59th day, you renew, you'll get another 60 days. That's the first renewal. And then on the 
59th day or the 29th day, you renew once again, that's your second renewal. So at the most, in one borrowing, postgraduate students, you can borrow up to 90 days without returning the item to the library. And for lecturers, okay, 60, 60, 60, 180 days. Okay, so you don't actually borrow the item for 60 days. You actually borrowed, you can actually borrow the item for 120 day, uh, 180 days. Okay, so that's a long time. Now, um, the thing is, what will, uh, what, uh, what if, okay, in what conditions would the system not allow you to renew the item? Okay, the system will not allow you to renew the item if somebody else put a hole on the book that you're borrowing or the item that you're borrowing, meaning they are waiting for you to return the item so that they can borrow the item. So if somebody put a hole on the item, then you will not, the system will not allow you to renew. Then you have to return uh, the item, whether you want it, we want to or not. Okay, so if you put a hole on the item, it will be listed under your holes here. Once the previous uh, borrower have written the item, you will see the status as uh, available here and then uh, the status will be pick up and you can just pick up come to the central library or whichever library that you have decided when you select uh, you pick up the item from there uh, and you borrow the item according to your borrowing privileges okay what if i renew before my due for example i can borrow up to 60 days but i renew it on my 30th day do i get 90 days straight away after that no okay all right uh, uh, you get from the date that you renew 60 days or 30 days according to your privilege yeah okay and then we have fines here if you have any fines um when do we block you for borrowing new books if you have any fines usually when it is close to about five ringgit okay so just make sure occasionally okay you come and check your your borrowings we uh if it's near to uh due you also will be receiving emails yeah uh, reminders uh, that some of the items that is in your checkout is due. So if you see the email, then you can decide whether to prepare for the return or renew the item uh, for you to continue using the item before re returning it. Yeah? Now, <coughs> there's a section here for requests. Okay, there's a section here for requests. So let me talk a bit about the request function here. Okay, um, this is the request function is actually list of resources that you have requested from the library when you use this particular service, which is what we call the document delivery or article request service. Okay, so you can go under using the library, you can go under request. And since you are a student and staff of UM, you'll be using the interlibrary loan and document delivery services internal. Okay, internal staff and student. All right, so what can you request? Okay, uh, you can request items like books, okay, documents, all right. So uh, what kind of books usually do you have access to? Okay, so first thing that I would like to highlight, Open Data Discovery or our catalog is actually an open access, uh, open public access catalog, which means that even if you're not a student of UM, or a staff of UM, you can actually go into Pendeta and see the collection, okay? And not just UM, every other public university in Malaysia also use an public, uh, open public access catalog, online public access catalog, meaning it's online, it's not in a computer, okay? So you have internet access, you can go in. So you also can look into the collections of other universities because there might be situations where you might be the pioneer or you are starting a research on a field that is not or has not been uh, cultivated the collection in UM as yet. Okay, uh, so you don't have a lot of resources uh, or books on the topic, but you really need them for your research. So you don't actually only have uh, access to the published content of the UM library. Okay, as a public university student or staff uh, in Malaysia, you actually can borrow resources from other public universities as well, okay? How do you do that? You actually just need to request the item through the library services, to the UM library services, yeah? So this is what we call the publication supply service, yeah? Okay, so uh, it's good if you know where the item are. So probably you go into the UITM catalog and you see a copy of the book is available there or you go into the USM library catalog and you see a copy of uh, that book that you want available there. 
Good. Then when you fill in the form, you can actually indicate one copy is available in UITM, one copy available in USM. But if you don't know, it's still okay. You can just still put in the details of the book that you're requesting and we will do the search for you. It takes a bit more time compared to if you inform us uh, where the book is available. Then we can just straight away contact the library and do the borrowing for you. But if you don't know, then we have to do a we have to take a bit of time to do the search for you. And uh, if the owner library allows the borrowing, then we will arrange for the borrowing for you. So if, for example, the book that you need is going to be from USM, for example, in Penang. OK, you don't need to go over there. We'll just contact USM. USM will courier, will send over the book here. You borrow from the library. You return it to us and we'll return it back to P Penang as soon as you are done using it. OK, so is there a cost for these uh, document delivery services? There are no costs for local universities. OK, so if you're borrowing from a local public university, so far there is no cost to you for the borrowing and for the transit of the item. And for now, there are no limit number of requests that you can make for document delivery, uh, for, for, for document delivery, meaning books uh, that you borrow from other public libraries. OK, so there's no limit for that. OK, so what are the item types? Okay, that you can request in this form, journal article, conference paper, book, chapter, book. Okay, so book, for example. All right, now, within the services as well, okay, within the same, it's the, all the same form. Later on, when we talk about um, accessing uh, databases, right, there are going to be certain resources from the databases that is not going to be available for the collection, uh, from our collection that you want to download, meaning when you want to download the article, they ask you to pay, or when you want to download the article, they ask you to log in even though you have already logged in at the A to Z uh, databases list. Okay, then that would be under the article request service. Okay, so document supply, interlibrary loan and document supply service. So article journal, for example. Now, there is a quota for this particular service. So let me make this a bit bigger for everybody. Okay, so for article request, okay, for free article, meaning with it budgeted for you for free, uh, per year. Okay, so for UM academicians, you have 30 free quota articles per year. For postgraduate students PhD, 20 free quota per year, meaning you get to it, you can request up to 20 free articles for us to purchase for you if we don't have it within our subscription. Masters, 10 free quota per year. And if you have undergraduate students in their final year uh, under you, okay, under your, the, the courses that you're teaching, then they actually have six free quota of free articles for the library to purchase for them. OK, now it is not transferable, meaning if you use only 10 this year, you want to use the, the, the rest next year. So you want to use 30 next year for PhD student, you can't do that. You have to finish it, finish the quota within the year assigned. Yeah. OK, what if you already use your quota, but you still want to request for the library to purchase more articles, then there are some charges for the purchase okay document charges so if for example for article it will be 20 ringgit per article uh not inclusive of supplier charges so if the database have different charges slightly a bit more than that okay this is just the library charges to, for acquiring the article for you but the supplier might impose a bit of cost for the purchase as well okay but of course especially if there are charges before putting in a request we will consult with you first OK, same with books. OK, so as I mentioned just now, um, OK, uh, for for local institution, uh, either there are no charges or there are loan charges or processing fee assigned. You can refer here, but for international charge, uh, international items, like for example, if the book that you want is not available in Malaysia, uh, we'll go and search for it in Singapore. OK, if there's a copy there, we'll consult with you first. You still want the book. The book is available in Singapore. If it's not available in Singapore, the last place that we usually look for the item for you is usually the British Library. OK, so for international institution, there will be the, uh, the postal charges for the books, either from the UK or from Singapore to um, courier the book over for you to use here. OK, so I hope that's clear about this particular service. If you need me to clarify anything else, uh, please, please put it in the chat and then we can cover it a bit more at the end of the session. Or you can consult any of our librarians to chat and they can explain it further for you as well. OK. Right. OK, so that is uh, 
what you're going to see in my account. So if you put in a request, in the request tab here in my account, you will see the articles or the book that you have requested and their status. Uh, yeah. Okay, whether it's available for you to pick up or we have received it. If it's in electronic format, the article, for example, it will be emailed to you. Okay, the status of the request can be checked here. All right. Okay, so remember if you're using public devices, make sure to log out of your account. All right. Next, we are going to look at uh, the second platform, which is the A to Z online databases. Okay, so what do we need to know about uh, a to Z online databases. So as I mentioned just now, any subscription that we have, any databases that we subscribe to uh, or publisher that have their own pub, uh, platform, uh, <coughs> uh, you can check here to see if the database is available for you to access. Okay, or within our subscription. So if you know the name of the database, you can search for the database within this alphabetical this thing okay so for example if you want to access a uh, scopus then you go to you go to s and scopus will be listed in the list um another way for you to use this listing if it is if you are looking for a specific type of content or you're looking for databases that are listed under a particular type of subject area so in that case you can use this uh, drop down filters here. Okay, so you can search by subject. So I'm a law student. So I want to know uh, which are the law databases that I can access to or what law databases we have. Uh, you can click in and you'll get a listing from here. Okay. Um, also, what uh, you can also uh, sort the database list by is by the type of either content or the type of um, access that you have for a particular uh, database. So for example, if I am looking for clinical tools, I'm from uh, the medical faculty, I'm looking for clinical tools, okay? Which database is actually categorized as clinical tools? Um, if I'm, for example, looking for legislation, if I'm looking for statistical data, if I'm looking for standards, I'm looking for thesis and dissertation, which database has thesis and dissertation, you can get the listing from here as well. Apart from that, how can I know if a database has content related to my field of study? You can just click on more, which were indicated under each link for each databases and a description of the content of the database can be found here. Okay, so you can see what kind of content do they have? They will specify that. Maybe subject areas that is covered under that field, uh, that that particular database, such as uh, for American Chemical Society journals, a uh, subject area is indicated here. Okay, so that's another way for you to ensure that when you do search uh, searches in that particular database, you're going to get content related to your field of study. Yes, is that a question? All right. Okay. All right. So, but what I want to highlight here, which is much more important is, okay. So I think it's very important for researchers uh, to know this particular, uh, particular function or particular um, uh, information if you want to uh, properly utilize or you, uh, the database list is first and foremost, whenever you are looking at, there are actually three types of database types that you need, actually need to know about. Okay, you need to be able to distinguish the three types because they give you different types of content. Okay, all right. So this is to ensure that you don't go looking for items that are not available in a, in a database that doesn't give you that option or that function, yeah? So when you look through the databases, you're going to see this indicator here, okay? So, all right. So this indicator here, especially this end part here, is what we call as the database type, okay? So there are three database type. First is the full text database. Second is the abstract database. Third is the bibliographic database. So these three types of databases give you different access or different type of content, okay? So we start off with full text databases. Full text databases give you content at the article level, meaning full text databases give you the full text of the article or book chapter or thesis, meaning the whole content of the 
paper, okay, if we subscribe to the journal or the issue, okay? All right, so full text databases is where you go if you're planning to download or read the article, okay? All right, and then you have the second type of the database, okay, which is what we call as abstract databases. So abstract databases also give you uh, uh, article level data, but they only give you data up to the abstract. Meaning, please don't try to go to Scopus and say, Puan, I go to Scopus, I cannot download this article because that's not what Scopus does. Scopus is an abstract database. It, it can link you, it can sometimes, it can link you to the uh, full text article, okay, especially if it belongs to a database that belongs to the same company as Scopus. Like, for example, uh, Science Direct, okay, then it can link you to the full text, but you cannot go to Scopus for the purpose of downloading full text because it doesn't give you access to full text, okay? All right, so if it doesn't have access or it's not belonging to the same publication company as Scopus, you will not be able to get the full text from that. Okay, so abstract, it gives you uh, article level information, but is that also to give you, for example, impact factor, or uh, we don't call it impact factor, um, there are different uh, measurements that Scopus use compared to ISI journals, yeah? Okay, so, um, but it gives you information about the article, all right? So if you want uh, to get the full text, okay, if the link is not provided in Scopus, then you have to know what other database that I can use to get the full text of this article, which we're going to address later. Okay, so abstract databases doesn't give you full text. Okay, they give you information about the journal, information about the article, but only up until the abstract. Okay, not the whole article. All right, but it does have different tools that can help you with the browsing, the linking. You want to do uh, linking searches and what we call linking searches where you want to see uh, previous articles or current articles that have cited those, those particular articles. Uh, Scopus can help you with that. And the last one that we want to know about, the type of database that we want to know about is what we call as the bibliographic Databases. So, bibliographic databases gives you information at the journal level of the content. Meaning, you will in bibliographic databases, you will not find article information, okay, name of author, uh, how many cited articles has been cited, how many times, nah, 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 nah. no article level information or journal level information. So, Journal level information means uh, impact factor, quota, all that is available from bibliographic databases. So we have full text, abstract and bibliographic databases. So you need to make sure for what activity that you want to do, you have to refer to the correct uh, database for you to access. Okay, so for today we are going to, uh, we are going to look uh, later on when we talk about indexes, we are going to go further into bibliographic and uh, abstract databases, yes? uh, uh, abstract databases. But let's now talk a bit about uh, accessing full text, okay? So as I mentioned just now, you can pick and choose your data types, uh, your database to search in using subject or using the types of Database. So you want basic information, you want uh, basic references, you have dictionaries and encyclopedia, different databases that allows you that. Okay, or maybe you have recommended databases from your supervisor, okay? Uh, okay, so for field of education, you need to use um, JSTOR and uh, business, you need to use uh, Emerald, okay? If you're in the sciences, uh, architecture, engineering, medical sciences, you go to Science Direct, okay? All right, so you can get recommendations, okay? But sometimes you might not have time to go and search through multiple databases. And I understand that because usually that's the reason that people give when they say, you know what, I, I usually prefer to use Google Scholar to do my searches because everything is included in one single search, right? Okay, but... Uh, it's not that it's bad that you use Google Scholar, okay? Some people just prefer to use Google Scholar and I can teach you, I'll show you later on, what you can do to ensure that even when you're searching Google Scholar, you can ensure access to any resources that we have already subscribed to. Meaning, meaning if we subscribe to it, you make sure that you log in first 
you search using Google Scholar, it will just allow you access without any issues, without you having to re-log re in or anything like that. Okay, but what uh, tool that we have that we subscribe for you, that we have prepared for you uh, to ensure that you can cross search um, uh, across all the databases. We have uh, 90 plus databases within our subscription. Okay, um, cross search all those databases and you get a single set of results from multiple databases. So you don't have to go individually. I have to go to JSTOR and then I go to Emerald and then I go to Science Direct and do a search again, again, again. I can actually use one database and I get the results from all these databases. So today we are going to look at uh, EBSCO Discovery Service, which is our integrated search platform. Okay, so let us let me open up <coughs> our, our EDS. So login. As per usual, you just choose your M staff and student. Okay, should be the same login as your email. If you have issues with accessing the online databases or accessing open access, please either consult uh, JTM, uh, Jabatan Technology Maklumat, the UMIT uh, department. Okay, all right, and they should be able to assist you with access because now it's a one key. Uh, one platform access, uh, how you access your email is also how you access other uh, service points uh, available for you M student and stuff. Yeah. Okay, so what you're going to see here, okay, so this is the landing page of EDS. So landing page means the first page that you see and uh, very similar to commercial searching platforms, you see one single search box, okay, so it depends on how detailed you want to do your searches, okay. So from here, I'm going to show you two different uh, useful functions. Okay, so first, before we go to uh, searching full text articles, okay, uh, searching articles within our collection, I'm going to show you how do you search for uh, journal subscription for UM users. Okay, so maybe um, you want to check to see if we subscribe to a particular journal. Okay, um, all right. Uh, or you want to see if uh, because uh, okay, uh, so what you can do is you just go into EDS and you want to use this function over here, which is publications. Yeah. Okay. So you don't do a search. You can do a search here, but the the most easiest way to do it is by using the publication function. Okay. Now this is useful for new researchers as well because you don't know what uh, journals is available for your field of study, for example. So I want to know, okay, how many journals do we have for engineering or for a certain uh, topic, for example? Okay, so you can use the publication function here. Um, it's a bit slow this morning. I'm not sure why. Usually it's very fast. <coughs> okay, there we go. All right, so you can, you have options, the option of uh, browsing by discipline. So you want to know, okay, for economics, how many journals we have? Uh, for sociology, how many? All right, so uh, this is the generalized subject area. So you can get a list um, if you select here, okay, and it will give you a listing of uh, the journals we have in the subscription. Okay, now even if we have the list here, okay, um, the content of the journal might be a lot more wider than the categories that it has been listed under. Like there are a lot of journals that are cross, um, uh, they are, they are inclusive of uh, multiple subject area or cross genre or cross subject. Okay, so just because a journal is listed under a particular field here doesn't mean that it doesn't have content for other field of study within within the journal. Okay, All right. So um, you can explore the listing or the individual journals further uh, if you're interested. Okay, so what kind of information does the um, listing gives you? Okay, first and foremost, remember we have multiple subscription according to publisher. So uh, databases is basically just a place where each publisher put all of their content so that you can cross, you can search their content within one single platform. Okay, but there are multiple examples of a particular journal 
being made available or is available from multiple databases, meaning it is available in JSTOR, but at the same time, it is also available in EBSCO. At the same time, it's also available in Science Direct, for example. Okay, so same journal article. So maybe the same uh, length of access as well, meaning from uh, the first issue to the most current issue or certain databases like JSTOR, they have their archived uh, issues, meaning, for example, everything until 2016 and then everything newer will be available from a different database because probably in 2017, the new publisher purchased the journal and now the current issues are put in their database. OK, so if you do not know that, like, for example, previously I found the journal in JSTOR, but I cannot find anything after 2016. OK, I don't know where which database it has gone to now. You won't have an issue with if you use EDS because no matter which database it belongs to now, if we subscribe to it, you can actually check it from the EDS. So let me show you here, for example. Okay, this is a very good example where this journal is available from Cambridge Journal databases, JSTOR archive collection, as well as Project News. So Project News is open access, yeah? Okay, so as you can see, the access also are all very different. So if you're accessing this journal from Cambridge, you can only access up to 2015. Okay, if you're accessing it from JSTOR, there's a full text delay from the current date to six years back uh, for the full text access that you have. Meaning, if I am uh, if I am trying to access anything from 2017 onwards, I will not have access to the full text. They will ask me to pay for the article or they will ask me to log in, okay? But if you already log in to EDS, you shouldn't have to log in again. And, but as you can see from Project News, okay? It is up to present, meaning the current, most current issue, you have full text access. Okay. All right. So this helps you out in terms of getting to know, uh, for example, you're using Science Direct or you're using EDS. Uh, you type in and you try to, you can, you say, you can, I can download an article from 2020, but I couldn't download an article from 2023. What is the problem? What I know. Okay. Then you can come actually and check here to see if there's a full text delay. So if there's a full text delay, then you head over to our request option. Sorry. Request. And put in a request for document supply and we'll purchase the article for you. Okay. All right. Okay. So that is uh, what you need to know. Okay. So this is the best way for you to check. If we subscribe to a particular journal, if we don't subscribe, if you search here and the journal, uh, you search for the journal title, it's not here, then we do not subscribe to the journal. Again, if you need an article, a specific article from the journal that we do not subscribe, please head over to the publication supply service. Yeah. Okay. So that is checking for journal subscription. Okay. If you have details about the article, for example, uh, you don't want to browse. Okay. You already have the journal, uh, the journal article. You also have the issue volume. You can straight away search for the item here. Straight away go at, to that particular volume. Okay. And search for the journal article as well. Okay. But, okay. Now we want to talk about searching because sometimes we don't search for references or um, literature uh, based on journal, okay? So a lot of the time, especially when we are very new to the field of study, uh, we want to get every single relevant article, no matter where, who's the publisher, which database it comes from, okay? Uh, you don't care, okay? So what you want to do, you want to use this particular searching function here. So you have your options. If you are just browsing, okay, meaning you don't have any specification for your search, meaning you're not, uh, you just want to see and then you want to filter your results later on, then you can use the single box searching. You have a couple of options. You can search by keyword. If you have a title, you can search by title. If you have author, authors that you are looking for specifically, I want uh, only the articles written by this particular author, you can search by author, okay? So, okay, so you just type in your keywords here, right, and do a search. Okay, so this is again uh, another best practice that I can share with you. Very important to remember, 
when you type in your search keywords, okay? Doesn't matter if you're using it on open data, doesn't matter if you're using an online databases or Google Scholar, you have to understand the point of view of the searching platform, okay? So for the searching platform, you have to understand each word that you type in are of individual equal importance. Which is why whenever we do workshops at the library, we always say, please do not type in the whole, for undergraduates, please do not type in the whole assignment question when you are searching for resources, okay? You have to know what is the topic that is being discussed by the question, okay? Because each keyword that you type in is of individual importance, meaning if you type in the word second language acquisition, for example, okay, the system doesn't just give you one set of results, which is second language acquisition. It also, they give you 2 million results because they also give you every results for second language acquisition, every result with the word second, every result with the word language, every result with the word acquisition. Okay, so you get actually four set of results. That's why you get a big number of results. And if you go further to the back of the results, you go maybe to page 10, page 20, page 30, you'll find that, okay, the resources are no longer relevant because it doesn't talk about second language acquisition. Maybe it talk, talk about uh, second something else or language, other topics about language or acquisition of resources, not acquisition of language. Okay, so what we want to do is if we have two or more words in our search keyword, we always want to search as a phrase, yeah? Okay, this is to ensure that the system gives us second language acquisition specifically in that particular order. So from 2 million results, we have now gone to 200,000 results. That's a big difference of number of results, yeah? Because we don't want a big number, we want accurate results, relevant results, yeah? So whenever we have two or more keywords, when we do searches, we always, always, always want to search them in quotation marks, like a dialogue to make sure the system understands, I want second language acquisition exactly in this order, okay? And then, uh, so for EDS, if for example, you need a definition for your introduction, uh, they have what we call a search starter. So the content for search starter is taken from basic references, meaning from actual um, dictionary encyclopedias. So it's not a content that you take from um, uh, online uh, websites, okay? So it's citable references, okay, that you can include, okay? Not like Wikipedia, for example, which you can refer to for your reading, but it's not a citable. Uh, reference okay and then you can do further from uh, you can do further filtering okay remember anything that is included within the publisher's collection can be found in the list but you have to remember we do not subscribe to everything within the subs uh, the publisher's collection okay what we subscribe in the journal usually is determined by your faculty your faculty says for um, this database, we are only going to take this package, this package, this package. Okay, right? So there are going to be certain content, even if we subscribe to the database, there's going to be certain content that we actually do not subscribe to. So if you don't have time, you know what? I, I cannot look at items that we don't have. I want only resources that I can download right now. Then you can do use the limiter for full text and it will only give you resources that you can actually download in full text straight away. Okay? And if you are looking for range of publication date, okay, how old can, uh, do I want to look at the resources? So if you are from sciences, usually you want to start off with the current three years. If you're from social sciences, you want to probably start off with the current five years according to the cycle of the publication uh, process, right? Okay. And if you need peer review is specified in the journal that you're submitting to, uh, please use peer review references for the paper that you're submitting for this conference, for this journal, then you can narrow it down to peer reviewed content as well. Okay, so what are the filtering can you do when you're using EDS? So please remember, yeah, when you search using EDS, it's not giving you just EBSCO resource, resources, it will cross check, it will cross search within other subscribe databases as well. Okay, so 
how can you know which database? So, for example, you're very new, okay, or you're doing a um, uh, collaborative research uh, with another researcher in a field that is not your main research field. Okay, so very new field, you're not very familiar. So you want to know, okay, which databases actually holds a lot of content for this topic that I'm searching. You can actually look at the content provider filtering option or uh, limiters. Okay, so if you see here, it tells you, okay, so which database give you the results that you see these 200,000 articles, okay? So for second language acquisition, for example, a lot of it come from ERIC, ERIC is open access, okay? Uh, complementary index, JSTOS, um, academic search elite, okay, so you know. All right, so these are the databases that holds a lot of content or uh, prominently publishes or has content in my field of study, okay? Another interesting uh, limiter that can be helpful to you is the publisher limiter. Which publisher publish in my field of study? This is get, going to be helpful to you when later on you're going to choose which journal or which publisher to submit to. Okay, or well, I want to know if I'm writing this paper in this field of study in this topic, who are more likely to publish my content because this is within their field of publication or within their subject area of publication then you can refer to the publisher listing oh then i need to look at if i'm writing about second language acquisition i need to look at wiley journals or sage journals or cambridge university press or taylor san francis journals okay all right or sage uh, sage uh, yeah all right so getting to know prominent publishers in your field um prominent database in your field can help you in more ways than one okay and the database can help you to get to know that so i hope this uh this uh i this uh, information is useful to you as well okay and then um in terms of soft types what kind of information what kind of resources you can get okay so you can get academic journals report dissertation thesis reviews magazines so magazines not uh your casual magazines yeah so academic magazines um uh professional magazines okay uh all can be found here as well um as well as um other types of resources electronic resources can be book chapters book series conference papers as well okay uh right and then we have the subject so if for example the keyword the subject that i used just now is a bit too general okay and i have actually a a much more specific topic that I want to cover under the search keyword then I can actually go through the subject. So one way that I can do it is uh, going through the subject. So I'm looking at second language speaker, teaching methods or in higher education um, or in a particular language, English, Spanish, uh, Chinese. Um, and also um, what is more important under the subject uh, limiter that can be highly useful for researchers is sometimes you want a specific type of content from the paper like for example uh, i need to read I, I need a few examples of a survey or a interview transcript or um qualitative uh, research that use qualitative or uh, method okay a particular method Unless you go and read the abstract one by one or you read the article, you might not know that the content exists, right? So the subject function, actually, if it's indicated by the author, can actually direct you to, cost to those specific content. So, for example, if looking for papers that have comparative analysis or questionnaires or interviews or, for example, case studies, test analysis, discuss qualitative research, quantitative research, OK, so it's not uh, compulsory for you to actually have to download the article first, read it up for you to be able to find specific content or a focus of the particular article. So it, it is not available like qualitative research or discourse, whatever subject is not applicable for every subject area. Some subject areas has it, some subject area doesn't have it. But I would suggest that you try and explore what kind of specification you can get under the subject limiter for EDS for your field of study. Okay, 
All right, so you can try. So what uh, you can just actually click on the uh, box, you go update, and it will bring you over to the article uh, that has that particular spe spe specification, like question S, right? And when you click in, if we subscribe to it, it will bring you straight over to the article. It is Friday probably, so it's a bit slower than usual. Okay, so bring you over to the article and you should be able to see the item. Okay, in full text. Okay, All right, so you can download it. If you're using EndNote, you can cite the item, download the citation straight away as you are doing the search. Okay, all right, so um, as you can see, okay, it doesn't only give you content from EBSCO, uh, also other databases is also included, okay? All right, um, so apart from that, okay, in the event that you are not, you, you are a researcher who doesn't have a lot of time to come and do the search on the database every so often, what you can utilize is the create alert function. Okay, so the create alert function actually is available for all databases. You can create for EBSCO databases, for JSTOR, for uh, Science Direct, any databases that you particularly specifically want to create alert for. So what does the alerts do? The alerts will forward you to your assigned email. Okay, so you can just put any emails that you want. A lot of researchers, they don't use their UM email. Okay, they create another different Gmail or Yahoo mail. Uh, for their alert so that it doesn't get lost in all the announcements that you am usually share with us. Okay, so they can just give, you can just use your personalized email, don't have to use your official emails, and they will send you updates every time an article or a resource uh, is created refer, uh, using the keyword that you have created the alert for. So for example, uh, I don't have time to come on EBSCO to do the search on second language acquisition uh, every other week. So what I do is I create an alert. Uh, I can choose plain text or HTML. So plain text uh, means that it gives me, uh, I think, up to an abstract. Okay, HTML, uh, no, sorry, plain text is the details. It doesn't give you uh, how the actual record looks on the database. HTML shows you the record exactly how it looks on the database. So that's the difference. Okay, so this is uh, this is the email that I want to use. So, for example, I use another personal email like that, and all the alerts will go into my personal email. So uh, I can also decide on the frequency. Uh, maybe every two weeks. Okay, any publication every two weeks that talks about second language acquisition, I'll get updated through my email. Um, if I want a brief or detailed. Detail brief, only the information of the article. Detail up to abstract. Bibliographic manager means I can straight away download the citation into my EndNote. Okay, and article published within, usually I put no limit because the frequency is already by weekly. Okay, all right. And then uh, I save the alert and it will just run the searches every two weeks and I will get the notification on my email. All right, uh, okay. So is there any question on the discovery service platform? Um, one, Anna, can yeah. you de demonstrate how to search for the thesis, uh, the ah. device thesis? Okay, can. All right. So uh, there are a couple of ways that you can search for thesis. Okay. First, if you're looking for UM thesis, okay, UM thesis, uh, first, you can actually search on Pandita. So, for example, if I do, uh, I can search by topic. Okay, I type in my topic first and then I narrow it down by type in the material type section. Okay, so thesis and dissertation for language acquisition. So these are all 198 results for language acquisition for master and PhD level thesis. Okay, so if you click in into the record, it will tell you in the dissertation note whether it's a master or PhD thesis. Okay, 
All right. Um, and the location of the item. Is it in central library? Okay, and things like that. Now, um, so this is um, all of the thesis listed. Another way for you to get the thesis listing, okay, so you don't want to use Pandata. I just want a list of the thesis, okay? Then you can actually just go down to this section, okay? A values like university library with global purpose. Okay, read more here. All right. And you can actually go to our library guide. And our thesis is available here as well. You go under T. This is and dissertation. Here, this is and dissertation collection. Okay, so here you can actually search by faculty. Okay, so I'm from economics and administration. Okay, so I want to see all the theses for master and PhD under my faculty. So here you can get a listing. Okay, PhD and then master. And if you want to know if the thesis is digitized, you just click in. They'll bring you to uh, the Pandita record. And if it's digitized, you will be able to see a link. So let me try to see if I can find a sample for everybody to refer to. So maybe science is medicine. Okay. Okay, so how can you know if the thesis has been digitized? You will see this particular uh, section here called electronic access. Okay, so electronic access, you just click on the link and it will bring you over to the uh, student repository. So later on, I'm going to share you with you about repositories, right? Okay, so this is where you go to download the thesis. So whatever thesis that uh, have been made available here, the majority of it is accessible open access, which means that you don't have to log in to access the full text. If you're not a student or a staff of UM, you can still download the full text unless the thesis is under what we call as an embargo, okay, or a full text delay. So embargo is when the owner of the thesis have put a restriction on the digitized version of the thesis until a certain time. For example, the indicated here, the thesis is restricted to repository, uh, repository staff until 31st December. After 31st December, then this thesis will be made available for everybody to look at or to access the digitized version. Now, what's the reason that the owner of the PDR, the owner of the thesis might put an embargo on the thesis? Sometimes because they are probably um, are in the process of acquiring patenting or there are certain content within the thesis that are confidential, okay? All right, so it might be on an uh, indeterminate embargo or maybe usually they are within a, a two-year embargo. But the thesis in physical format is actually accessible to you. So if you see here, you can't download the uh, digital full text. The thesis itself in print format is actually either available in the central library or in the library that uh, the faculty belongs to. For example, this one is available. A copy of the physical thesis is available at the TJ Danaraj Medical Library. Okay. All right. So um, one, you can search straight away from Pandata. Two, you can go to the library thesis and dissertation collection library guide and search from there. And if in the event that you're definitely not in campus, okay, you definitely cannot come and see the pre uh, thesis. Uh, you only want to see titles that you have access in digitized format, okay, digital format. Then the best way to do it is, again, you are here under a value select. So I'll show you again how we get here. Library website, the yellow button, read more under a value select. And what we want you to do is we want to go to digital at UM. Digital at UM. Okay, so we have different repositories. So uh, this is institutional repositories, content that are created or published by UM. So of course we have subscribed databases here. We have the common repository where uh, we have our historical content here. 
if you are looking for journals, uh, UM journals, meaning you're, you're looking for um, past issues of uh, your faculty journals, it will be at e-journal at UM. Okay, so you, okay, you can just click in. And all of our journal you uh, uh, UM journals are available here. You can search for the journal title. You can if you want to don't want to subscribe, uh, you don't want to scroll. You can type the name of the journal if you know the journal. You can just do a cross search like that. And then we have uh, the UM research repository. So if you want to uh, for lecturers, yeah, especially if you want to increase the visibility of your papers. So for example, you uh, submitted a conference paper to a conference, but that particular conference doesn't have its own website or your conference paper are not made visible by the by the conference, but you want it to be searchable so that people can cite you. OK, then you can actually upload it into the UM research repository. So in the event that people have a copy of your thesis or your slides or your any content that belongs to you, OK, uh, and they include it in their publication. When they submit to turn it in, turn it in will be able to go into the UM research repository and highlight that this actually this content belongs to this author, which is you. OK, so this is to increase the visibility of your content just in the case other people use your content within their publication and did not cite you for it. OK, so if you want to know more about how to include your content in research repository, you can contact our archive department. OK, uh, you can just chat with us and we'll give you the uh, person in charge for you to consult for uh, depositing your uh, content that you want to make more visible or searchable uh, in the UM research repository. And lastly, the student repository. So the student repository is where we put our thesis and dissertations. Yeah. So anything that we have digitized, and either already made available or will make available after embargo for people to access full text for our thesis and dissertation will be under the student repository. You can search by year of publication or year of graduation. You can search by subject area. You can search by your faculty and departments. Right. Right. And you can click in. And usually most thesis will be available in full. OK, so this is just the cover. The content is here in full. OK, so you get actually the full content. So for our postgraduate students, if you want a sample okay, of the thesis, you want to know what does it look like? OK, uh, what do you need to refer to? OK, you can just actually download the full text from here. OK, so these are the repositories. So I hope that answer your question for how to access thesis for institutional thesis, yeah? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, okay, so since we are talking about thesis as well, yeah? Uh, so for online databases, if you want international thesis, meaning thesis not from UM, okay? International thesis, then we have our thesis database, which is ProQuest Dissertation and Thesis Global, okay? So you can refer, uh, you can get a lot more, a, big, a bigger collection of thesis uh, from all over the world uh, under ProQuest. OK, you have access here. Usually it's all full text as well. OK, um, I'm not going to touch much for other databases um, because most of the functions of the databases are quite similar. OK, the filtering of the databases are all quite similar. Like, for example, if we go to another big database, which is ScienceDirect. Now, even though the name of the database is ScienceDirect, right? ScienceDirect actually has uh, expanded their repertoire. They have included a lot of resources also for social sciences and humanities. Okay, so even if you're not from sciences field, uh, the, the, science, uh, the sciences field, you're from social sciences, you're from uh, humanities, uh, you can actually get a lot of uh, publication, uh, journal articles, uh, content from Science Direct as well. And a lot of databases like EBSCO, like Science Direct, like Xavier for Science Direct, they have also included open access journals. Okay, so they have in their collection open access journals and those can be used as well. Uh, and open access journals that are not under any particular publisher can be found um, in this 
uh, in this page as well. So online databases, if you want to know, okay, what other open access resources I can use, uh, open access resources are available here. You can click under open access resources and you have uh, different uh, institutions um, sharing their publication, different open scholarship press, okay, for a lot of um, professional bodies. They have a lot of sub, uh, uh, they have a lot of publications that are very useful for you. If you are not looking for content purely on the academic side. Okay, so uh, uh, if you want uh, details, update uh, what's happening on the professional side of your field of study uh, or your field of work. Okay, um, trade publications. Uh, okay, if you're more familiar with the term trade publications, then Open Access Guide have those for you as well okay so you can refer here for those uh, open access uh, national open access uh, repositories okay open access journals open access databases okay there's a lot for you to refer to here okay educational resources open textbook library if you are uh, if you feel that you want to share with your students or you want to include a textbook that 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 uh, doesn't require the student to purchase okay or you want uh, to share with them open uh, open source uh, textbooks you can get them okay you can browse through the open textbook library as well okay all right uh, you want to include them when you are creating the your new course or your new course content uh, you can consider those as well okay right so we are only halfway okay but the majority of our content is already here okay so before we move on to indexes is there any questions that you want to ask about databases hi yes so i want to ask uh, regarding the create alert that you have mentioned earlier can i get mm -hmm. you to explain about what is the differences what are the differences between html and pin text Okay, thank you. All right, so um, okay, let me just go back very quickly. Okay. Okay, so plain text, okay, plain text usually are the details of the articles, but only in text format, meaning uh, meaning you won't have any colors, pictures, they just give you the details like title, what, author, what. Okay, so plain text is just information about the uh uh, information about the items that uh, falls under the subject area that you have created the alert for. The if you pick the HTML format, it will look exactly as how, how you see on the database. Okay, meaning when you get the alert, it looks like this. Okay, it looks exactly like you have the picture of the academic journal, you have the color, the 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 icon for the PDF full text, things like that. Okay, so HTML shows you what it looks like on the database, but plain text is just words. Okay, so it's just details. So what's the difference in terms of uh, uh, the two, the space that you use in your email? If you take, if you get it in plain text, then uh, it's not going to include the space that it will take, okay, uh, for the picture, okay, or everything that is a visual picture and uh, formatting all actually makes makes the record or makes the email heavier for you. So if your email is full, for example, it might not go in because the email is too heavy. Okay, it's kind of like uh, if, for example, um, you're getting a message, right? Okay, you get a message on your WhatsApp. Uh, if you just send text, it comes in a lot easier. But if you send a picture, it will load because the content of the format is a lot heavier. OK, so it depends on you if you uh, it's according to your preference or maybe the, the space that you have. OK, if you're using an email that you use that has already a lot of content, you might not want to use HTML. You might want to use uh, text. Huh? Mm. I hope that answer your question. Yeah, that's very clear. Thank you. Brian. OK, all right. One more thing that I would like to highlight. Yeah, there are certain databases uh, that might not be full text access outside of the campus. I think um, last time I had this inquiry uh, about um, Taylor and Francis Journal, where the, the student who's trying to download the article is currently 
situated in Kedah, for example. So when they go in the A to Z databases, they try to download, it says that they don't have full text access. But if I access it from here in my office in UM, okay, if I'm in the campus and I'm using the campus Wi-Fi or the campus uh, internet, uh, when I try to log, when I log in, I can access the full text of the article. All right. So in those cases, what I would suggest is, okay, you consult one of the librarians. You come and join us on chat, okay? You join us on chat on Sari or uh, you go into Sari first and then talk to a librarian and says, I'm trying to download this article from Taylor and Francis, for example. Okay, but uh, it tells me that I don't have full text access. Uh, it might be only campus access. Could you check for me? So if we check for you and we have access to full text, we don't have any issues with actually emailing you a copy of the article. Okay, especially if you're not in campus, right? Because they are going to, especially if you're in your hometown, in your country, okay, in your home country, for example, uh, if you encounter a resource that is only campus access, you might not know, that's why, contact us through chat or contact us through email. Uh, we are all here. You can actually contact anybody from this list, okay? So the librarians, if you don't know who to approach, you can just actually contact anybody and we'll try to assist you. Okay, but uh, uh, if you're emailing them, it may take a bit of time. So um, if you want uh, quite uh, instant feedback, uh, please, uh, during office hours, okay, please just check with us using Suri. If Suri cannot help you, then it will just direct you straight away to the librarian in charge and we'll try our best to forward you the document if you cannot download it from your locality or from where you are. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so any questions about online databases before we move on to indexes? Okay, so we have talked a bit about navigation just now. So the second part of our session, which is navigation. So we have looked at um, interesting uh, functions and tools that are available from, uh, from EDS where you can check our subscription for journals. You can also check uh, how, uh, how do you get full text, even if you don't know which database that full text comes from, okay? And also uh, you can check, uh, uh, you can actually narrow down your search to a specific content, like uh, maybe a specific methodology or spe a research technique or um, research content or data collection content, okay? You can use using the functions available in EDS as well as how to acquire resources that is not available within our collection. Okay. Uh, <coughs> right. Um, I think we can just go ahead. Okay. Um, okay, so let's um, look at the third part, which is indexes. So um, what I have here is, probably uh, the two major ones. You probably have other indexes that you, that, uh, because I'm sure there's uh, for some faculty, because uh, usually faculties doesn't forward us the requirement of your publication for your postgraduate students, okay? Um, so we usually only get some information when student consulted with us in regards to the indexes, yeah? So what we know is uh, for each student postgraduate um, master and PhD, they are required to submit publications and there are different categories, okay? Category one is ISI, for example, A, ISI. Category B is uh, Scopus. And then you have different other indexes, localized indexes for certain subject area, okay? So what I want to show with you today are the two major indexes, okay? So we have either the Web of Science Index Journal. So that's the Web of Science Index Journal is equivalent to the ISI journal. So sometimes you hear people say Web of Science Journals or ISI journals. In this case, they are both the same. Uh, they're referring to the same indexes, okay? And then, so I'm going to show you how to verify your journal title. So if you're considering to submit to this journal, I need to submit to an uh, ISI index journal or Web of Science index journal. First, how do I get the list of journals? Okay. If I don't know, if I nobody's recommending or I don't know which journal to submit to, what journals are available to me? How can I get a list of the journals that are included in the indexes? I'll show you how to do that. 
and then verify or if you already have a journal to submit to okay this is the journal that i plan to submit i just need to verify whether it's an isi index journal or web of science index journal before i submit to this channel yeah and then uh, if for example your faculty or your supervisor requires you to provide also the quartile of the journal and the impact factor of the journal, how do you check those? Okay, so we will be using the JCR database, Journal Citation Report, our bibliographic database to check the quartile and impact factor. And then next, um, we are going to see how we can acquire the Scopus data, uh, journal listing. Okay, so does the journal listing change a lot? Okay, usually uh, the journal listing is updated by Web of Science or Scopus, uh, maybe middle of the year and also end of the year. Okay, all right. So uh, uh, sometimes ISI is only once a year, which is the middle of the year. And Scopus sometimes they update the list uh, middle of the year and end of the year. Okay, but usually they will indicate to you when they have changed. So for example, Scopus will tell you this list is uh, updated when. December 2022, for example, yeah. So let's uh, go and see how we can acquire those uh, indexes. Okay, so indexes, Scopus, Bible Science, and uh, we are looking, we are using the database JCR to check the citation. Okay, so let's start with Scopus first. Okay, so how do you get a list? So how do I know if the journal I want to submit to is indexed by Scopus or how can I check to make sure that the journal I plan to submit to is indexed by Scopus. So first and foremost, you just head over to Scopus. What you want to go to is you go to the bottom of the page and you click on content coverage. So content coverage is the journals listed that you can find details for in Scopus when you do searches, either by title, either by keyword, either by abstract, either by author whatever searching options that you want to use. Okay, so once you click on content coverage, you go down further and you go to the section called title on Scopus and they will give you a list in Excel format. So the list is actually very, very heavy, very, very long. Okay, so you don't actually need to download, oh, sorry, you don't actually need to download the um, you don't need to download the listing every so often. As I mentioned, usually they update either middle of the year or end of the year. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at how we do that. So as for Scopus, we click in for Scopus here. Okay, so at the page, you scroll down to content coverage. Scroll down further until you go to title on Scopus and download the source title. So it takes a bit more time. Okay, it's quite heavy, All right? The thing is I have downloaded it before, but let me see. And this is what it's going to look like, yeah? Okay, I need to stop downloading this. Okay, cancel. There we go. Okay, so this is what you're going to... Okay, so this is what you're going to see, yeah? Okay, so this is the um, Scopus index journalist okay so you can search by title if you want okay you can search by um you can search by our conference proceedings okay uh accepted titles new titles included in the scopus journalisting okay so probably prior to december 2022 these journals has not been indexed okay but after december okay uh it has been indexed together with the discontinued continued titles. Meaning, if you decide to submit to a journal from Scopus, refer to the list, okay? Make sure that it's not within the discontinued title December. Okay, what if one, 
what if the list come out in December? I submitted in July and they have accepted my publication in July. Okay, but I'm graduating next year. Okay, December suddenly they say they discontinued the indexing of the, uh, it's not, no longer belongs to the, the Scopus Index. What should I do? That's why you should always download the listing so you have paper trail. Okay, all right, so you can show. Okay, actually the title only discontinued in December when I have received my um, acceptance for publication is actually in July. Okay, so you have to consult your faculty on what you need to do in this case. Yeah. Okay, but the full listing is here. Okay, what you want to check always, always what you want to check, you want to look at the this column. A active. Okay, I cannot make this bigger. Is it? <laughs> you want to look at the column for active or inactive. Make sure, make sure, make sure that the journal you're submitting to is in the active section when you decide. Okay, right. And then coverage is ongoing. Okay, coverage is ongoing. Okay. So these are the only two things that you need to check. So this is the journal that I'm submitting. Okay, I just need to check whether it's active and it's ongoing. Then it should not be a problem. Okay, right. Please make sure when you are selecting your journal, submitting to your journals, uh, there are two things that I want to highlight. First and foremost, always check to see if the journal is a predatory journal, if they're asking you to pay, and it's not open access journals or um, the name or uh, what we call as a chameleon journal or, or uh, is categorized as predatory journal where it has a name that are very similar to an actual journal. Meaning, for example, the journal, the original journal name is AACE Clinical Case Reports. Okay. But a predatory journal pretended to be this journal and it puts there as AACE Clinics Case Reports. But because you didn't check properly, okay, you have submitted to a bogus journal or predatory journal. So please, please, please double check, triple check the website of the journal that you submit to, ask around, make sure that the journal that you're submitting to, even if it belongs to the Scopus listing, make sure it doesn't have a bad reputation to avoid issues with your submission status later. Okay, All right. Okay, um, any question about Scopus before we go on? Okay, all right. So please do explore, okay, um, the Scopus listing. All right, next we are going to look at our Web of Science um, index journal. So what do we need to know about uh, WOS index journals or ISI journals? Okay, first and foremost, please be aware for University Malaya, other places, not within our discussion. In University Malaya, there are only three Web of Science indexes that are eligible for your uh, graduation requirement publication. Eh? Okay, so either you submit to a journal within the Science Citation Index Expanded, index or the social sciences citation index or the arts and humanities citation index can you publish in a different index according to your field so far what i've heard is still okay meaning if you're from uh, sciences but you publish in the social in a social sciences citation index journal uh, it's still okay okay i've not heard so far from other parts of the university malaya if you need to stick to your field of study for the index, okay? So you can um, submit to any of the index listed here for ISI. So ISI status or Web of Science status for index for submission, usually group A or category A in your documents, it should be from these three indexes only. Okay, but Puan, I saw another index. Yes, another index that you sometimes see is the Emerging Sources Citation Index. Is this ISI? It is Web of Science, but it is for UM, it's not considered as ISI. Okay, it doesn't go to category A. Okay, why? Because the Emerging, <coughs> sorry, yeah. The Emerging Sources Citation Index are journals that 
are showing very good progression promise but they have not reached the level of the uh, citations within the journals in the SIC, uh, SCIE, SSEI and AHCI as of yet. So where does it belong to in your categorization? Okay, according to UM, ESCI, Emerging Sources Citation Index, falls same level, falls together within the same level category as Scopus. Okay, so if you have submitted to Emerging Sources Citation Index, okay, you cannot, okay, it's not included in category A, it will be included in category B together with Scopus. So I hope this is clear for everybody in the session. Okay, this is something you need to clarify. So because a lot of people got excited, they say, oh, I'm definitely using the Web of Science Index. But which index did you refer to? Okay, which index the uh, which index did your journal that you have submitted to is placed? Okay, very important to check and double check and triple check. Okay, so how do we check? Okay, um, okay, let's see. Yeah, so what we need to do, we can just actually <coughs> go over to um. The master journalist. So you go open your browser, you type in master journalist. Okay. The first result will be where of science, master journalist. Okay. So if you have a journal title, okay. For example, this is the journal title. You click search journals. Okay. And it will give you, if it's listed in any of the web of science indexes, it will give you the details here. Okay, control, press, press, press. Okay, so what you want to check is the index it belongs to. So for Hellion, okay, if you want to publish in Hellion, then you're okay for category A because it is listed, currently it is listed in the science citation index expanded. Okay, right, so this is how you verify. So, what do you need to do? I always recommend this to researchers. Okay, one, um, how do I make sure that later on when people ask if I've done my checkup, my check, my verification, okay, what with what I can prove that I've done my verification? Every time you do a verification for any journal, you go and print the page of the search. Okay, what you want to do? You print the page of the search. Okay, you have the title here, you have the index here, but what is more important is this, the date of the search, okay? So it's stated here for uh, January 20th, 2023, okay? So in the event if previously it is indexed in one of the three indexes, and then when you check, uh, and then next week you submit your paper, Okay, later on, for some reason, the journal has some issue and it is removed from the index, then you have this paper trail. You have this proof set. When I submit my paper, I've already checked it is actually included in the index. Okay, you need to create a paper trail for yourself. Okay, I need to emphasize this for researcher. Yeah? <coughs> especially for this kind of things you need to create a, always leave create a paper trail of your activities so that in the event that they need you to prove i've done the check i've done the verification i've done this this is when i did it this is the proof of date okay right so this is just best practice when you do any verification you don't need to come to the library to do this you can do this yourself you can just print the document save it it's print uh, it's safe in pdf save it in your google drive okay all right. Okay, you can also get a listing. Okay. So for example, I want to know, okay, I want to know all the journals that are available under the indexes under accounting and finance. Then I can just pick under category. Okay. Uh, clear off. Let me see. Clear off first. Clear off. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back. Uh -huh. Okay, search journals. You can click on search journals. Okay. And okay, 
free. Okay, I think you need to create an account to get the listing nowadays. Yeah, the platform changes quite often. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Let's see. I think I need to remove this from here. Three. There we go. Okay, so make sure you don't have any word in the search box, yeah? Okay, so I'm looking for all other uh, journals under the indexes uh, for accounting and finance. Uh, this is how you get a listing as well. You can also download this listing, okay? All right, so you get the titles, you get which citation, uh, which index it belongs to, okay? You can share, you want to message it, you can link it, share with people, share with your supervisor if you are considering okay uh prof or doctor i'm considering this journal and this journal and this journal and this journal okay these are the statuses on the wos index okay all right so uh, before we go ahead to jcr is there any questions about verifying journals for either scopus or web of science indexes i'm sorry can you repeat again how how, how to check in web of science like the first step like uh when Which, we enter, our web of science when we first enter the website then then why should we go i miss uh, miss out your step just now okay <coughs> <coughs> all right first and foremost okay let's go to the um browser yeah so your google browser you type in master journalist. The first result is Web of Science master journalist. If you already have a title, you just type in the title of the journal in the box. And the, if the journal is available in any of the ISI, uh, ISI or Web of Science indexes, you will get the listing straight away. And what you need to do is you check the index it belongs to. If it falls under the three indexes, Okay, if it falls under any of the three indexes, then okay, you are usually um, submitting to an ISI index uh, journal as specified by UM. If not, if not, then if you're submitting to, sorry, yeah, if you're submitting to Emerging Sources Citation Index, then you should know that you are actually uh, just uh, submitting to a Category B journal. Okay, is that clear? Oh yes, thank you. Welcome. Okay, any other question in regards to Scopus and checking, verifying ISI journals? Um, sorry for uh, ESCI. Uh, I mm -hmm. already submitted, uh, I already published two papers, but uh, they even uh, can, do, do not consider as a Scopus for uh, academic staff uh, when I uh, wanted to get mark, KPI mark, I received only one score. For Escopus, we receive five score, but for that one, we receive only one score. I see, yeah, because we follow the uh, announcement made by UM usually. So like, for example, the one that I have shared here is actually a uh, an announcement by UM. So, um, since you have mentioned that, I will clarify with uh, the 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 um, the department uh, to make sure that this has been um, yes, yes, implemented I, across UM. Yeah, yeah, I just received one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for because Scopus, for Scopus normally receive five a score, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. for this one only one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, informing us as well, because usually sometimes this information doesn't reach the library fast enough for us to update you with it as well. OK, all right. Um, so we will have to clarify on the ESEI. But as I mentioned, what is more important is previously is uh, equivalent to Scopus, but now it's not equivalent to Scopus anymore for, for academics. But that is for academics. Um, we will try to clarify if for students as well, it is the same case, but usually there are slight differences between the categorization for postgraduate students and academics. So it might not be equivalent for academics, but it might still be equivalent for postgraduate students. So uh, library will clarify, but I would suggest you also clarify this 
with your faculty because faculty changes their policy quite often and usually uh, they don't update the library on the change of policy. So I always recommend to students if before you submit, OK, please clarify the policy of the categorization with your faculty first. Yeah. OK, but thank you so much, uh, doctor, for for sharing that with us. Um, I will clarify. You're most on welcome. It. Thank you. All right. OK, so let's go ahead with the next section. OK, so uh, if you created an account on Master Journalist, uh, you can actually get the full listing for each uh, indexes in Excel format. Yeah. OK, so that is um, one part, uh, one way for you to get the listing as well. All right. <coughs> OK, so let's go ahead with JCR. OK, so as I mentioned just now, JCR is a bibliographical database, so it does not give you information about uh, the journal at the uh, article level. It gives you the information uh, of the journal at the journal level. So uh, if you're trying to find full text article in the database, you might not be able to get any from there. Yeah? OK, so let's click in into journal citation reports. OK, so you have a couple of options here. You can straight away search the journal name uh, in the search box here. OK, but another way to get to the full listing, you can click on journals here. All right, you get the full listing here. You can uh, type in the name of the. Uh, journal. OK, for example. All right. Now, um, OK, so this is an open access journal, even though it is indexed by uh, websites, but it is actually an open access and uh, index journal. OK, so what we want to highlight here is the categorization. OK, so a journal can have one or more categories that it falls under. OK, sometimes a journal has one category it falls under, okay, multidisciplinary sciences or accounting, or, okay, but sometimes they can fall under multiple categories, and each category will have a different um, quartile ranking, okay. So maybe for um, business, if it falls under category business, um, the quartile ranking is higher, but for the same journal. In a different category, maybe, um, for example, for uh, human resources, it falls under a lower uh, lower quota. All right. So uh, usually what we heard is that uh, when you submit, you will follow the higher quota. But please inform me if I'm wrong, especially if on the on the on the academic side. OK, when you you. Uh, need to inform of the quota, for example, usually you have to indicate the higher quota. Okay, but it might be different nowadays, okay? Okay, so once you have found the, uh, the general information, the impact factor is indicated right at the bottom here. Okay, so impact factor. All right, now what if, uh, uh, all right, for example, okay, when does the impact factor appear? Okay, as I mentioned, the indexes usually are updated middle of the year, okay, for Web of Science. Usually, you can only get the impact factor of the journal for the year after uh, after the second half of the year, okay. So, usually, for example, for 2022, okay, you will only get the impact factor of 2022 after June or July of 2023, okay? You get the impact factor of the previous year in the second half of the next year, after the second. Usually that is when, okay? Uh, you get the new quota for the previous year. So as you can see, <coughs> in, the, in January 2023, we are still referring to the 2021 quota. Okay, not yet 2022, even though we are already in 2023 because the impact factor has not been calculated yet. It is usually only going to be available in the second half of 2023. Okay, so you have the general citation indicator here. You have total citations, okay, and the ranking would appear slightly lower in the page. All right, so this um, 
journal has only have one category. Okay, so multidisciplinary sciences. So for this category, this journal falls under the Q2 quartal. Okay, so what does quartal means? Okay, for the total number of journals within that category, okay, the top 25% is Q1, the second 25% is Q2, the third 25% in the list is Q3, and the last 25% is Q4. So if you have 100 uh, journals in the category, Top 25 is Q1, top 25 journals, the next 20, uh, 26 to 50 is Q2, uh, and so forth, okay, for each quartile. All right, so um, can you compare quartile or impact factor in between field of study? No, okay, all right. So, for example, if you're from sciences, okay, um, five, uh, for example, sciences, um, if you have a impact factor of uh, five, you're not very high. You're quite in the middle, Q2 or Q3. But if you're from social sciences, if you have five or both uh, impact factor, uh, that probably place you in a higher in a higher um, quota, for example. So it's not comparable between field of study. It's only comparable within the categories. Uh, okay, within the category. Uh, so different field of study, sciences, 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 okay, usually um, not comparable. You cannot say, oh, this is high because so in social sciences is high. Okay, so you have to only, it's only comparable within the category it belongs to, yeah. Um, because uh, the publication of sciences uh, um, in the sciences field is a lot faster compared to social sciences. That's why when, I, when we were talking about the range, right, of uh, references or literature for us to refer to. Okay, in sciences, usually three years, we start off with three years, and then if we don't have enough, we go further back. For social sciences, it's about five years. Humanities doesn't even have impact factor. Okay, they have index, but they don't have impact factor for humanities. Okay, so impact factor is not applicable for journals listed in the humanities index. Okay, some might have, but in general, uh, it's not applicable because for humanities, okay, the publication or the citation is not as robust as sciences, especially sciences and as social sciences. Okay, so again, if you want to search for journals, okay, you have the options of using the search box or straight away go to the journals option, type in your title, and then you refer to the category to see how many categories it belongs to. If it's relevant to you, you go down straight a bit further to the impact factor if you need to indicate the impact factor and scroll down to the bottom a bit further for the, sorry, for the quartile, yeah? So I think I missed it, yeah, for the rank. For the quartile, yeah. Um, so you can see the quartile here, the current quartile, uh, the current placement in the category, which is 27, 28 out of 70 journals. So this category doesn't have a lot of journals, only 74 journals. Certain categories have even less, certain categories have more. Okay, it all totally depends on the citation calculation, yeah. So they, they decide who goes into the index and then. Uh, the ranking is based on the calculation, and this is the um, the the progress or the performance of the journal within the last five years. Okay, so some journals they go up and down the ranking quite often. Okay, right? Some journals they uh, the placement doesn't change much. Yeah. Okay. All right. So any questions about JCR? Uh, there are a lot of different uh, other different functions in JCR. Especially if you're looking at, um, you can explore the category section uh, to see if um, uh, there are certain journals that are a bit more robust than others, or you want to see what are the categories, what is the status of research in particular categories, okay? Um, if a, particularly, a particular topic is published more than other categories, okay? So there are a lot of different types of uh, tools in journal citation reports that can give you uh, certain details about your field of study, uh, which relevant journals you can refer to or you want to 
explore further. Okay, uh, under countries and regions, you can see a uh, number of citations, number of journals published for that country. Um, you can download all the listing as well and you can refer to insights. Okay. All right. It takes a bit of time for you to get familiar with. Uh, oh, I cannot log in. All right. So, um, Actually, insights, uh, let's see, let's see. Ah, okay, so what you can do in insights is um, you can actually, I cannot log in, is it? Okay, so these are the three functions in insight. Um, analyze, report, and organize. So if you create your account, you can create a personal account, yeah, in uh, JCR, in insights, and uh, as I mentioned just now, you can see pattern for research um, research uh, preference. Okay, see what topic is popular now. Where is the to the, the the topic is popularly written about? Maybe you can can consider if you are writing in that field of research, you want to think uh, about or you want to consider which country would be suitable for you to find collaborative partner with. Uh, so those kind of uh, things uh, can be useful for you uh, if you refer to the different tools available in GCR or Insights. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Uh, yeah. Wait, yeah. Uh, how can we go to Insights? That is under which? Okay. You can you uh, because all the Web of Science databases have the the the, the tools or the tabs at the top, right? Okay. Um. So far. Uh, previously, we have uh, access to insights, okay, but I'm not sure if currently we have include, uh, we, we still have access. So, if we have access to insights, okay, um, either it's going to be straight away available under I in the A to Z databases list, okay, or if not, uh, when you sign in, okay, when you sign in, you create an account, then you have access to insights. So I would suggest that you create an account. Uh, but for now, since it's not available in under I yet, I think temporarily we are not having access to insights for now. Uh, previously, we, we do have access. But so for now, uh, the one that we definitely have access to is GCR. Mm. So is uh, the insights we can, uh, is under JCR? Uh, it's the same company as JCR. It's under Web of Science. Oh. But it's a different platform. So once it's available, once it's made available, then you should be able to find it under I. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Welcome. All right. Um. Okay. Is there any question about GCR? Um. Well, I'm just like you mentioned that for mm. for sciences, it's mm. Q1 to Q3, and for social sciences, it's Q1 to Q5, is it? No, 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 no. Um, sciences and social sciences, quota is all the same, Q1 to Q4. Okay, sciences also have Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. Social sciences, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. What I mentioned in terms of 3 and 5 is how, uh, what is considered as current research in that field. So for sciences, okay, 3 years is considered current research. Okay, updated current research because people publish a lot and frequently in sciences. Social sciences, it takes you a lot longer to get published usually. Okay, or it's not as, uh, it's not uh, get, uh, you don't publish or certain topics doesn't get published as often or as quickly as sciences. So when you say current research, five years for social sciences, five years is considered current research. Uh, so it's not about the quota, it's about what is considered as current research. Oh, New articles. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, oh, this is so scopeless. I mean, let me try. Go into GCR again. Okay. Custom reports. Yeah. Yeah. Previously, the custom report functions is here, but they have separated the insights from the GCR. So I'm not sure when we will have access to JC, uh, to insights back, but so far we only have access to general citation report GCR at the moment. Uh, so hopefully if we have access to insights, you can just see it available 
uh, under I on the A to Z databases list. Yeah. Okay. So any questions about um, about the uh, JCR database or verifying your journal titles or checking for your impact factor or checking for your quartile? It's very straightforward. You just have to know where to go and do the search. What do you need to do while you do the search, which is always save your searches, always uh, print, use the print option, save it in PDF, make sure you have the dates, you have the paper trail and you should be okay. Okay, and always clarify the policies with your faculty because sometimes even between intakes, the policies change at your faculty. So you have to make sure you are updated before you do the submission, not after you do the submission of your paper to the article, uh, your article to the journal. Yeah, before you do submission, make sure you have clarified with your faculty on the policies. Okay, right, we went quite fast. Okay, it's only 11, but uh, we have um, done two, three, third, three fourths of our content. So let me uh, go ahead with the slide so that we can go ahead with the next section. Yeah, okay, so just now it's indexes. So the two major indexes uh, for the other indexes in, in your listing, maybe category C, category D, uh, you can actually clarify with your faculty on that. Yeah, because usually those doesn't require a particular platform uh, unless indicated. Okay, so before we go to tools, I have uh, informed you that I'm going to share with you uh, two national databases, right? For you, uh, so you can get full text resources from there and also uh, some uh, uh, abstract information about thesis at national level. So what do you need to do? You just go use your Google and you can just type my journal for the journal, yeah, for the national journal database, my journal, okay? So my journal, this is the Malay spelling, J-U-R-N-I-N-A-L. Okay, so this database is provided by the Ministry by the ministry of Higher Education. Okay, so you just click in. They have included not only journals, locally published journals, but also um, uh, conference publications, yeah? conference papers. Okay, so this is what you're going to see, all right? So it's provide uh, is actually built by the Citation and Informatic Center, um, and uh, you can browse either by title if you have a title. If not, you can choose your subject area, um, or you can do a search by topic. Okay, so for example, if I'm looking for language acquisition, gen articles for language acquisition. Okay, I can search by article. Okay and search right so they'll give me the details okay at article level yeah there we go all right so usually 98 percent 97 98 percent of the journals uh here are all open access okay there probably might be only one or two journals that have been acquired by a major publisher to be placed in their database okay but uh, so if you come here and you try to download the article, but they say they don't, you cannot access the full text, probably because it has been acquired by a publisher to, uh, to put into their database. But other than that, usually you can click in and they will just provide you with the full text of the article, right? So this is useful for uh, researchers who are localizing their research okay so for example you are um, uh, redoing a research that has been done elsewhere you want to look at how the method or the research uh, uh, as, uh, if implemented in a localized setting okay right you want to see if other people have done research on the topic uh, maybe preliminary research, maybe a survey, maybe they have done some kind of data collection that you can work on with. Okay, so localized content, okay, um, is available here and most of it are all open access, okay. Unfortunately, the platform doesn't give you uh, um, a function for citation, meaning you cannot export, unlike the databases that we subscribe to, you cannot export it into your EndNote. So that's why 
if you want to know how to do manual input, okay, create a citation based on the information of the article or book. Okay, you cannot import your citation because the article is not available on a commercial platform. Then please join our free EndNote web, uh, uh, workshops, okay, that we have every week. Um, and we'll teach you step by step on how to um, use EndNote at the um, basic level. Okay, all right. Okay, so this is for uh, journal articles, conference papers. The next one is thesis. So you have, you know how to search for thesis, or UM thesis. So now I'll show you where you can get the thesis titles. Usually you get it up to abstract. Sometimes some of them giving uh, give uh, the access to non members of that university up to about two or three pages or ten pages. Okay. Uh, but if you want to access the full text of other public universities, okay, they have it in print format. What you need to do is just bring your student ID or your staff ID, your UM uh, student or staff ID, go over to that university library and you actually have access to their resources uh, without any payment for free. You can just go in and because you are a member of uh, the public university libraries association, so you can just go in and you can refer to their thesis or refer to their resources. Uh, for free okay so what do you need to do here in your google you type in my toe not my town yeah <laughs> my two my two my thesis online okay so my two is malaysian thesis online database it covers 24 institution it has about 146 thousand theses listed in here under four languages and you can do your search by subject or by uh, institution. Right. Okay. And it will tell you which, institu which institution the thesis comes from. Okay. The authors, um, the thesis advisor, the supervisor. Okay. And such. Click in. And usually, if it's not from UM, okay, they will give you up until the abstract, if I'm not mistaken. For some, they will give you up until, up to about 10 pages. But uh, usually, they will not allow you full text. The full text digitus, only University of Malaya allows full text access for the whole thesis um, on our repository. No other universities in Malaysia allow the digitized version to be accessible for non university or university staff or members uh, or students at this point okay all right so if uh, so other people can see your thesis and they can cite your thesis and they can put in you in their references okay so they definitely your citation account uh, can come from there as well okay uh, but as you can see they give you this kind of information and not much else okay all right Okay, and maybe a bit details on the bibliographic data of the uh, data uh, of the article uh, of the thesis. Now, uh, an example from UM, for example. Okay, so ours, what people do is when they go and search here, uh, sometimes they are linked to our repository. Okay, uh, sometimes there's a link, but uh, permanent link. You can click on here. Okay. Oh, this is uh, a link for this page, okay, not for uh, the record. They have to come to our um, repository for them to get the full text of the item. But what is useful here is you can check and see if there are any interesting titles for you to refer to uh, within your field of study. If you think you want to inspect the thesis further, you might need to go over to the university and refer to their printed version of the thesis. But this allow you to cross check to see, okay, maybe if you want to do a search for this topic, but you want to narrow it down to the current three years. So 2020 to 2023. Okay, so you can see a um, pattern of what is popular for thesis uh, or research in that field uh, within that timeline. 
Okay, right. So uh, you can access to UM thesis. You can access to all the thesis available from multiple um, public universities in Malaysia as well as international thesis using our subscribe database, which is ProQuest Dissertation and Thesis. Okay, so that's all covering your access to resources and navigation of our non databases and uh, not only our local data, our local and institutional or subscribed databases, but also uh, national databases for journals as well as for thesis. Okay, um, all right, so let's go ahead with, I think we have a bit more, so let's go ahead with our tools. So, um, you have multiple tools provided to you by the IT department. Please remember, tools are provided by the IT department, so they are the administrator, uh, they, uh, they, they acquire all the tools. So, what does the library do? We help you to, the, uh, to a small extent um, in terms of how to use the tools, okay? So... Of course, your faculty could call in trainer and uh, I think EDEC also did uh, or uh, HR also did a training on EndNote recently. Okay, so if you join the training, okay, uh, you might now be very good at using EndNote. But in the event that a three hour class or a four hour class is a bit too much for you. Okay, so we also conduct uh, free EndNote courses throughout the year. So as I mentioned, uh, throughout the year. So first, let's look at where you can download it. So for students, you need to um, head over to umsitsguide.um.edu.my. Okay, uh, you can um, you can also check from your UM student portal. Okay, for staff, for academics, you need to go to your staff portal. Okay, you go to your staff portal, you go to uh, software, okay, and you can download the you can download the software from your staff portal. All right. So um, the current version, the most updated version of EndNote that we are that we have access to that we are currently using, and that we also use for training is EndNote twenty. Okay. However, the functions for uh, EndNote twenty and the previous version, which is EndNote nine, uh, EndNote nineteen, is not that different. Okay, function is all the same. The only difference between EndNote 19 and 20 is the online platform. But the library doesn't cover training on the online platform. We only cover the training for you for the for the for the um, device version for the one that you install in your devices. Yeah. Okay. So please remember, please follow the instruction when you are download uh, installing the software. Please make 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 sure you extract. The, uh, because when you download the installers, it will come in a zip file. Extract it from the zip file first so that you are actually using the institutional version of the software, not the trial 30 days version. If you do not extract the EndNote folder first, open up the folder first, it, you will only be using the 30 day EndNote trial rather than the institutional version uh, of EndNote. Yeah? Okay. Um, Okay, so um, if you need some help in using EndNote, you can also refer to our lead guide. Okay. Okay, just scroll down to our library guides. Okay. We have a page just for EndNote. Okay. So you can actually go to E. And... Um, if you need to know how to download the software, okay, what do you need to remember when using the software, things that we always recommend to you when you're using software, any citation management software for EndNote, okay, right, backing up your EndNote library because you're going to be using it for a long time, okay, if something happened to your device, if something happened to your library, you want to safeguard yourself, okay, so all of the things we cover with you on the uh, on the training. Okay, so how can you register for the training? Where do you go? Okay, so if you want to register for the training or any training, not only do we have training on using online databases, uh, using Pendata, EndNote, we also have other platforms. Uh, whenever we have uh, vendors, okay, publishers coming in with us, we will also put the registration link there. Okay, so where you need to go, you can just head over to this person here okay 
user education ses session. Register here. Okay. Right. You can view the schedule here. Uh, you can click read more and it will bring you to the registration button and it will give you, it will bring you over to the full uh, list right now. Okay, so for January, we do not have any sessions registered, uh, uh, open for registration uh, because the librarians are also involved with uh, university courses, with uh, elective courses. So we are finalizing the marks for this semester. But uh, in February, we will restart the uh, workshops and you can register for the workshops here. There are no limits to the number of times you attend the workshops. And usually the, the, the workshops is held between 12 noon to 1 p.m. And the end note sessions is divided into three sessions. So you don't get overwhelmed with the amount of instruction. We first teach you a small part, okay? And then the next day we teach you a different part. And the next day we teach you uh, another part. And since it's offered throughout the year, uh, if you miss one of the session, you can always join us in the next part of the session when it is open for registration. Okay, so that's a note. Um, I will not talk further, uh, but we do recommend that you join us and the academics as well. If you have any member of your faculty, they don't have to be academics, they don't have to be your students. If they are administrative staff that you want them to know how to use a note, or they are your research officers, uh, research assistants, you want them to know how to access online databases. You want them to know how to use EndNote. They are welcome to join. There are no limitation for them to join the sessions. Okay, right? Please do recommend it to uh, relevant people in your faculty as well. Because we do have academics joining session. Of course, we have uh, postgraduate stu uh, students. Sometimes we have undergraduate final year students as well. Uh, one thing that I would like to inform the academics are uh, previously all undergraduate students are required to take the university compulsory course, information literacy, where they are taught how to use softwares like EndNote and information searching. But starting from the new SPI, a lot of the courses now uh, doesn't require the student to take the course. Okay, so only the students, who, uh, undergraduate students who are trained in using um, the citation management tool and searching skills, they are only the students who take it as an elective. OK, so you might see a big difference in terms of uh, the knowledge, the know how on using tools like this in between the, the students who are already nearing uh, the end of their studies and the newer intakes uh, uh, within your faculty. Yeah. OK. All right. Um, OK, sorry, but I know uh, where, where should we click to for the registration for the courses again? Uh, OK, from the website, right? Let me just uh. show you. Okay, so from the website, okay, okay, uh, this is the library website. You scroll down to this person over here, okay, and you see upcoming. Did you see the screen here? Uh -huh. Uh -huh, okay, so you see upcoming user education session, register now. So you click here and you see the yellow button. So you just follow the yellow button. So yellow button, read more yellow button, register here, and you get to the full uh, schedule here. Oh, mm. just now there's a, a page where uh, there's a listing of UM research repository, student repository, where should we ah. get? How should we okay. get? All right, from the library website, okay, you scroll down slightly under the search library resources search box. There's a yellow button here under a values university library with global purpose, okay, here. And you'll be brought over to the electronic resources page. Digital at UM is where the repositories list are. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, sorry. I would also like to ask, what's uh, what's the difference between my journal and the I Malaysian index that you mentioned just now? Okay, um, I Malaysian index is uh, our own UM collection, so we do the collection ourselves. OK, so we uh, there are going to be certain resources from conferences that doesn't exist anymore or we do the collection so that uh, and the resources is only journal article, book chapter and conference papers. OK, so three types of resources exist in I Malaysia collection. All right. Uh, the My Journal is a live database, meaning 
uh, all these journals are existing journals currently being published at all the public universities faculties in Malaysia. Okay, so they have their owners. They have their owners. So um, um, when they publish a new issue, they will update the new issue there on uh, on the platform. Because previous, uh, the My Journal is actually very new. Our I Malaysian collection has been around for quite a long time before the My Journal database exists. So uh, they feel that there's an importance to have a collection like I Malaysian. That's why they decided to have the national database. Okay, so the national database, the, the My Journal is a more current database. Uh, so if you want to use My Journal, uh, better because the 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 platform is much easier to use. The information or the, the articles are much more current. It's updated as when the the journals are updated at the university that they are published in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Okay. So if we don't have any questions about and not. Let me finalize our session today with our last topic, which is turn it in. Okay, so turn it in. Um, actually, okay, the administrator for turn it in, as per any software, as per any platform, which include your spectrum, which includes our websites, all are under the governance of the IT department. Okay, so if there's any issue with any uh, any issue with any digital platform that you use. It can be your spectrum, it can be your email, it can be your website. Uh, then you need to inform the IT department using help desk. Okay, so what do you need to do? You sign in as per your email to help desk. And then if you have a complaint or inquiry, you can just click new ticket and then select your category, your department. OK, so if it's a service, uh, it's an issue with library, for example, your borrowing, OK, or access to databases, uh, OK, lah. then you can select library and then select the product here. But if it's a software, OK, if it's a software like Turnitin or platform like Turnitin or software like EndNote, then you have to refer to ICT services. Okay. Um, okay, software for teaching, SPSS. For the researchers, if you downloaded the SPSS or if you are accessing SPSS, okay, you have issues with it. Okay, then you select. Uh, the receiver has already been selected for you like that. Okay, so if you have a complaint or inquiry, and then you put in your details here. All right, so they will try to rectify the issue for you. Okay, so... How can you use Turnitin? You have a lot of options in using Turnitin. Okay, we'll start with the student side first. Yeah, uh, For students, you have a lot of options in using Turnitin. Um, your supervisors will have accounts where they can provide you with class ID to submit. So this is usually usually for your final, th final year thesis, your dissertation. Sometimes your supervisor says, okay, please submit your thesis. Um, to this class ID. Okay, so that would be their class ID. Okay, sometimes they pre they they provide you with a submission a point on Spectrum. Okay, if you are as uh, if you are registered to their class. Okay, their class uses Spectrum. Okay, they can put a turn it in submission point on Spectrum. Uh, but if your supervisor doesn't mind, meaning they don't need you to submit to their class ID or you are submit uh, you are just submitting to check the similarity okay before i submit to my supervisor i just want to know okay what percentage do i have okay i just want to check uh, if my similarity is high or low or i'm submitting to a journal article okay so my lecturer or my supervisor uh, doesn't have a class id currently so where can i do to check then you can use the library class id okay so the library class id is for anybody to use in um okay uh, student can use it, staff can use it, academics can use it, uh, but we change the class ID every Friday. Okay, this is because we have a high number of usage for the class ID. So if we don't change it often, then uh, there's going to be a bottleneck. Okay, it's going to slow down the the turning in use. Okay, so that's why uh, to ensure that 
also the user use the class ID responsibility responsibly. You don't share it. You cannot share your class ID with people outside of UM. Okay, and there's a reason for that. Okay, if you want to know about the uh, for lecturers, uh, you 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 can join the turning in training provided by EDEC because there are certain functions in turning in that the library doesn't have access to. Okay, so we provide the class ID just for checking. Uh, there are certain functions in the in the and in the turning in that only is access accessible for lecturers for academics. Okay, like uh, delimiting sources, for example. Um, but for library, we only provide it for checking. So if you're like, if you're submitting to a journal, you don't want to create your own class ID, you can also use the library class ID. Yeah. So in our lib guide list, we have the T for Turnitin. Okay. If you are using the library Turnitin class ID, what do you need to know about the library Turnitin class ID and setting? You can read it from here. All of our class IDs are what we call as uh, non-archiving. So the library, whatever you submit to the library class ID, only the library class ID, not the spectrum class ID, not the lecturer's class ID, unless the lecturer set it so that it doesn't archive. Okay, library class ID is always non-archiving, meaning you submit anything, it will not save, it will not archive the document, it will only give you the report. Okay, uh, unlike uh, lecturer's account where they can decide, okay, I want to archive or non archive the submission. They have to decide on that when they create the class ID. Um, Spectrum by default, it is archiving, meaning when you create the submission point on Spectrum, okay, by default, it is archiving. You have to click on the setting so that it doesn't archive if you don't want the student to, uh, if you don't want to archive the student submission to that class ID. Okay, so how do I get the class ID and enrollment key? We have a uh, we have a um, step by step instruction on how to do it. Okay, so usually we change the class ID every Friday. So today we have a new class ID for us to use until next week Friday. Okay, um, how to create a report or how to generate your report? How to use it? How to submit your document? How to download your report? How to filter? Okay. So, a uh, filtering for students, for users, you only have this filtering here. Meaning, if you are uh, quoting any resources, you take any resources, you quote, quote as in, quote very different from summarizing, from uh, paraphrasing, yeah? quote means you do not change the syntax structure, the sentencing, the wording of the sentence. You have to make sure you put them in quotation marks so that you can filter them out when you use turn it in. So anything that you put in quotation marks, okay, because you take it exactly as it is from the original source, you can actually exclude it from your percentage. But if you don't quote and you don't cite, then you will not be able to filter it out. It will be reflected in your percent uh, in your uh, percentage. Also, you can also exclude your bibliography, your reference list. Okay, so. It doesn't matter whether you submit uh, you submit your paper together with your reference list or omitting this, omitting your reference list. The policy depends on your faculty. If your faculty says when you submit your document, it has to include reference list, you submit it with your reference list, but then you exclude the bibliography here so that the reference list is not reflected in your percentage. But if your faculty says um, you can exclude, you are allowed to exclude the bibliography, you just put in the content of your thesis, then according to your faculty's policy, you can just omit the bibliography, your reference list when you submit, and it definitely will not be reflected in your percentage. Okay, if, and also always check with your training policy at your faculty, some faculty has it. I know for a fact, education faculty definitely has a training policy. So please check with your faculty, what is their training policy before you submit your final thesis with your report. Okay, can you exclude certain amount of words? Can you exclude certain amount of percentage? Meaning, for example, uh, in your percentage list, in your result, right? Um, okay. Okay, this is what you see when you uh, get your simulated result. They will tell you this 23% comes from where. And you have to understand, uh, turn it in is indiscriminatory. 
meaning they don't care where the similarity comes from, it will reflect here. And that is sometimes problematic because sometimes you are referring, for example, to a book, okay? You are referring to a book or a journal article. So, for example, 5% will come out from that journal article or 3% will come out from that journal article. But the same section, okay, somebody took the wording from that journal article, put it on their website, okay, or put it on their Twitter or put it on their Facebook and at the bottom of the page, there's 1% from that website or that 1% from that Twitter, even though you have never seen that website, you have never seen that Twitter, okay? But Turnitin will pick up from there as well. So that's why it's important for you to check with your faculty on the policy for delimiting percentages as well, okay? All right, check with your faculty. Are you allowed, uh, if I have too many 1%, 1% and it's all from sources like a website, or Wikipedia, or you know, those kind of resources that are not actual references that you have not referred to because you have your references that you actually downloaded and referred to and cited, then you have to inform your supervisor, you have to consult your faculty. Okay, that's the only advice I can give on the topic, yeah? Okay, um, all right. Okay, so one thing, okay, um, there are, uh, in terms of submitting your document, there are certain rules and regulation. I do always recommend that you use Word document, um, not PDF, um, not so much. I mean, you can submit those documents, but sometimes it might affect the length of time you are provided with the report. So usually, we don't see any problems if you submit using Word document. Try to make sure it is uh, below 400 pages. There are rules. Uh, um, under file type and size, we have indicated here. Usually, if it's under 400 pages, it should be okay. I think they have updated it to 800 pages. Yeah. Okay. What other things that can delay the time that you get your report? Sometimes, okay, if you have um, indexes, uh, annexes, um, lampiran, meaning, uh, for example, your survey questionnaire, not the, it's not part of your thesis, right? part of your thesis content or pictures, graphs, a lot of pictures. Some of you, your thesis has a lot of pictures. Okay, those are the kind of things that might delay the report creation or might uh, be too heavy, okay, right, because there's a size requirement as well uh, that might stop or uh, uh, refrain uh, turning in from creating your report. Okay, so usually when you submit your report, it should, if it's the first time that you submit your report, it should take about 30 minutes, one hour max. If it's the second time you submit, you amend it, you redo, 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 you amend it, you submit the report again, uh, maximum it takes one uh, one day, 24 hours, okay? It should not take more than 24 hours. If it's more than 24 hours, okay, consider your document, resubmit, okay? Don't wait more than 24 hours. Oh, I'm, I, I think I should wait two hours, uh, two days, no. It should not take more than 24 hours. If it doesn't give you the report in 24 hours, then reconsider your document and resubmit. Okay? Sometimes it's not even the problem with your document. Sometimes turning in server might have an issue. At the time when you submit the document, there's something wrong with their website or something wrong with their server. Okay? So a lot of things can happen. Uh, please try not to do it last minute. <laughs> okay? All right. Okay. Is there any question about turning in? Yes. Any? Yeah. Uh, morning one. So I have a question regarding the library class turn it in. If I hand in the turn it in in the library turn it in, so mm -hmm. it's like um, and then my submission is the next day. For example, it's Friday and Monday. Mm -hmm. I, I so the class ID is what uh is refreshed one week once. Will will the spectrum turn it in reflect the document that I've actually submitted oh. on the library? Remember, library doesn't save anything. So if you later on, you submit again on library also, whatever you submitted previously will not appear. If you submit to Spectrum, whatever you submitted to the library will not appear. If you submit to your lecturer's class ID, whatever you submit to the library will not appear. Hmm. Anything that you submit to the library account, library class ID will not appear anywhere else. Cannot uh, I cannot say the same thing for submission to Spectrum or your lecturer's account. Uh, but for library, we have selected the setting as non-archive. So, no matter how many times you submit, even to the library, you submit the same uh, thesis five times, 
none of the previous submission to the library account will reflect on the new submission. It will save in the database. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's not archive. Yeah, archive means it's saved in the Turnitin, uh, Turnitin archive or Turnitin database in the US. So even we don't have access to it. So sometimes lecturers, when they create this class ID, either on Spectrum or on their own account, they forgot to non-archive non -archive the setting. So they accidentally save or archive the, doc, the student's submission, even though it's just a draft of their first chapter, second chapter, third chapter, whatever. Okay, so now every time the student submit the amended chapter, there will be a similarity. Uh, okay, so that is if you did not set the setting, to non-archive. The library class ID is always set to non-archive. Ah, that's the difference. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Can I have a request? Yeah. For this recording session because there are too many things. To oh, yeah, quite. There's a lot. I think uh, Puan Umu uh, recorded the session on uh, right? <coughs> Yes, um, the recording will be available later in this chat also. Mm, yeah, uh, so right. you can always go through the session again. Thank you so much. Really so appreciate awesome. it. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, so before we, uh, so that's it. The turning in is the last, um, last uh, portion of the session. Is there any question? Maybe from the access point or the navigation or the indexes or the tools that you you might have uh, questions about okay if you don't uh if you have follow-up questions maybe you can email us uh my details uh is available on the library website you can just google me i know heidi you emily and you'll get my details my contact details there as well um uh, i'll try to assist you if you need immediate help please uh refer to the chat service three on our library website and there's a librarian there to assist you as well um, the slides uh, have been shared with you in the chat and Pan Umo will share the video and hopefully uh, what we have uh, I've shared today is useful for everybody to a certain extent and I wish you all the luck for your uh, research activities. Right, thank you very much for uh, for uh, joining the session. Um, one yeah. mm. isn't the slides are in the chat box? Uh, yes, uh, Pan Umo. Is uh, right? yeah, um, it is available in your Google Calendar, but I will uh -huh. share here too. Can you just hold on for a while? Oh, thank you. All right. So you can check your Google Calendar or uh, later on the link will be provided by Panumu, yeah? To okay. email, our email. Uh, your calendar, your Google Calendar. But I think you just wait a bit and Panumu will share it in the chat. No worries. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Panano. You're welcome. All right, uh, Panomo, I think we, we, we are okay. We are slightly early than schedule. Sure, no problem. I just want to confirm, so uh, the yeah. recording of this session will be uploaded through the Google Calendar or? Uh, it will be available here in the chat. Once I stop the recording, the uh, Microsoft team will process it. Right. You can just come back here within a few hours. Okay, sure. All right. Thank you. Okay, so I think I think that's it for us today. Thank you very much, Puan Umu, for inviting me for the session. For the session, and thank you everybody for joining for joining us. Please do come and join our workshops uh, if you are available. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Have a nice holiday for everybody. Thank for this you weekend. so much, Puan and all. Thank you. Bye bye. Welcome. Bye. bye.